I know there's going to be a lot of issues discussed tonight, and I didn't know how you may want to handle public input. Uh, naturally, one way would be to take public input before you get started. Another means you could take public input would be as issues arise and you can deal with an issue, then take input on that issue. Or perhaps you might want to discuss everything and at the conclusion take input so that people may want to comment on what the discussions were. So I see those as your options as far as how you might want to take public input. If we have issues, if we have two sides of an issue, uh, I guess you could have three sides, I don't know what that would be, but if you had two sides, what uh, can we ask if there's a spokesperson that can speak for the individuals? We, so we don't have everybody coming up here, would that be wrong? Well, I think that what the practice has been is that if you have you know, one person speaks to an issue, they have five Five minutes. minutes, the rest of them will have three? Correct. Okay, so that's what you So that's, that's the way I would handle that. Oh, could we start allowing anybody to get there? Well, it's, it's up to the pleasure of the board if y'all want to, however y'all want to structure it. doesn't matter to me. You can let people speak first or in the middle. Or it just Mayor, I would, I would appreciate if you all would vocally state whether you're going to allow it or not because this is a special workshop. What you voted on was taking input at regular meetings and regular workshops. Well, that won't be a vote, but it will just have a consensus. That's right. I, I think it's fine. I'm sure it is. Well, I'm yeah, I'm good for that. Vote. Yeah. Sound like it's a uh, consensus and we didn't vote. Sound uh, like we have a consensus and it's okay. So it's, it's uh, y'all's pleasure. Uh, if you want to do it, let everybody talk at the beginning, which is fine with me. Uh, doesn't matter to me. Mary, by the way, kind of sure. right. frame the issue that we yes. talked about. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Here we go. I hate keeping my back there, buddy. Uh, <coughs> I think everyone that's here has, is familiar with the issue. We're talking about the historic or, or signage as it applies to the historic district and the city as a whole. Uh, as you'll recall, we've had several meetings, a, a, a minimum of four meetings uh, regarding this. Mayor, initially you had assigned a uh, committee to review this issue. The committee met from the original committee. It kind of split it off into two different committees. You had a, a group of people that were uh, representing the historic district and then there was a group of business people and then we had another meeting with with all of those concerned I don't see Jeff here tonight but Jeff Daniels was involved in a lot of that along with Kim uh, Brown and Cole. Anyhow we, we gathered all this information together uh, uh, staff presented it or Bert and his uh, team presented it to the Historic Preservation Commission and to planning and zoning the staff recommendations uh, of which you all have a copy of in front of you there that the, that we presented. I uh, can't remember if it was a uh, council meeting or a workshop the last time we talked about this, but then it was decided that we need to go back and frame the issues which our attorney has done for us and all of council has responded uh, to each individual issue. And that's the other copy that you have in front of you before you today. So we're here tonight so that um, we can try to, to get all of the council and the staff and, and the community together to come to some kind of idea of what we can um, potentially present to uh, Lee Burns with DNR. Um, you know, it's been, it's, it was, we had a conference call with her at the council meeting one night. And there were a lot of issues that came up from that and now we're at a point that we need to decide how we want to proceed or what we want to present to DNR and that's where we are tonight. Are there any questions regarding that? Larry, if I could just sure. elaborate on that a little bit. Tonight, you know, what, what I did when I framed the issues, I was hoping that when I got the responses that perhaps we would have some consensus on some of the issues and that I could then maybe frame something to Ms. Burns to present as a proposal. When I got the responses back, it seemed like there was a lot of, you know, there was no consensus that I could really put my finger on to uh, develop something to, to submit to the Department of Natural Resources. So everybody got a copy of the issues and got a copy of what other council members felt about the issues. So tonight, you know, this is kind of a discussion of these issues so everybody can kind of talk about what their position is and, and why they have their reasoning. 
and once we've had this workshop tonight, then what I would contemplate is that we would have a special call meeting, perhaps after our workshop uh, on the 16th. And at that point in time, council can formally make motions as to how they want to frame a proposed uh, draft of an ordinance that we could then submit to DNR for their you know, review and recommendations. Once we have done that, and we got the uh, recommendations from the Department of Natural Resources, it would be my feeling again that we could take those recommendations, work, you know, again, make one final workshop of our draft of our ordinance, make any revisions to those based upon what we got from Ms. Burns, and then actually you know, frame the final ordinance and then adopt any uh, amendments to the Land Development Code or the Historic Preservation Manual. <coughs> Well, first of all, I'm, I'm hot. Is anybody <laughs> in the place hot? I'm about to burn up. Am I the only one? what is the, the best means by which to conduct this workshop, but perhaps maybe what I could do is since I kind of developed the issues, maybe we could just, you know, I could frame the issue and then we could talk about each one as we go through. Is that okay with everybody? Right. What I, uh, the first issue that we, well, I'm sorry, what are you going to do about it? I'd rather take it up front, but now look, I want to hear from Charleston. I think we should do it at the end, so everybody can understand what we're, what we're going to say, and then they can... Might take care of some questions that they would have had. Yeah. Okay. Everybody okay to do it at the end? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. As long as they get a chance to speak if they want to. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Right, what I did, uh, as far as the first issue, was try to determine illumination uh, in the historic district and the uh, sign types. And we had option number one where uh, I stated that where I proposed, uh, although indirect lighting is preferred as means of illumination, other means of illumination could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And then I enumerated you know, several factors that I have seen in other ordinances to consider whether, you know, other types of illumination should be in the historic district. That was one option where you could just leave it up to the Historic Preservation Commission to determine, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis based upon any factors or criteria that you may feel be appropriate for the Historic Preservation <coughs> Commission to consider. The other option that I saw that may be available to council is actually just specifying what types of signs you do or do not want in the historic district. I believe, if you all have reviewed comments from your other council members, I believe there was a general consensus of option number one with some suggested revisions to option number one by various council members. So that's where I think we are with that particular issue on illumination, which would include the LED, the LED signs which we are basically talking about these EGD signs, which you know we have a definition that we that I've included in here about an EGD sign, which includes all different types of media and changes uh, in sign uh, displays. EGD signs are electronic graphic display signs. So that's just for those that who may not know what the acronym is. I'm just looking. Uh, my notes here on the option number one. And I'm not sure if you captured this when you, uh, you talk about the changes. Uh, I had had some, just some little minor stuff. Uh, some of it may not 
actually matter, but although indirect lighting is the preferred means of illumination, other means of illumination could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We recommend that other means of illumination could be considered by case-by-case -case striking that out. So did you do that when you, you used the option one? Uh, what I did, Mayor, is I took your comments and I have in included what you suggestions were as to those revisions to option number one. Is that on this page? Uh, turn the turn the page. Uh, it should be in color. Your comments should be in red, I believe. Oh, cool. Okay. And then I think uh, Council Member Mary uh, Ann is in green, and I think Chris is blue. And I forget what color we got to. What about West now? We've got, got West on board. We True, but I have not had an opportunity to speak with Wes about his uh, thoughts. Correct, and we, of course, we have, uh, I think we've got you some information to hopefully that you have enough yes, to make an informed. Yes, we got today, uh, looking over it uh, pretty brief day, and able to really come to a significant conclusion on it. I do have some thoughts that I was watching the uh, meeting 10 10. There's a couple of questions I want to ask, and I don't know if uh, Ms. Burns ever uh, got back to us, but did she ever uh, answer the figure amount um, of tax credits and grants that they have issued? She uh, sent a list that was, uh, it was kind of confusing. It was a list that was combined. It was Tifton, Valdosta, and another community. I don't know why she included the other communities, but there was not, a, what I was looking for was an aggregate number, right. and she didn't include that. So, um, so the question that I asked specifically was not answered. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> my opinion, uh, I'll just make a real brief opinion here, is, uh, you know, as long as we don't uh, interfere with that uh, affiliation with the state historic district and make us lose those grants and those tax credits that are out there, you know, I'm for anything that would as those tax credits and grants are, a, or are there for our developers and community. So um, as long as the state's okay with it, I would be okay with it. But uh, that's from the little bit I've read so far, that's, that's how I'm going to stand so far. I think uh, that once this has gone up to DNR, right. they've had an opportunity to review it. And we can kind of get a little bit of feel whether or not they're uncomfortable with what we're right. doing. Uh, it's difficult to determine whether or not that has any effect as they certify local government. Right. Uh, but certainly I think that is a concern, which is reasons that we want to work with them to ensure we don't jeopardize our status. Exactly. Okay. Anything else? What uh, we just not use Mariana? <coughs> My understanding from what I, it's a, certainly this is a very difficult means by which to address these issues, as I understand it uh, from uh, the mayor and council member Terrell, is that the language in option number one, as far as uh, giving is it my understanding, Mayor, that you and Council Member uh, Terrell are in agreement to allow different types of illumination in the Historic Preservation District on a case-by-case -case basis that's determined by the HPC? Is that my understanding of, of your comments? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it says here this would allow latitude to the HPC. Let, let me just say right at the forefront. I hope I'm speaking to the business people that might be present. My whole concern is that a business that's located in the historical district and the same type of business that's located outside the historical district needs the same guidelines. You don't need to have one bunch has got to go to, a, to a, an HPC meeting, go through all the chaos and the aggravation, <coughs> and then have that done. Now, 
And we need to change something in the HPC manual. I understand that. So that those signs don't have to go before the HPC anymore. And probably need to put it in the LDC. And because all I want is equality. I don't, I don't, I don't want a, uh, a, a, uh, a party bloom store, historical district, and a party bloom store outside the historical district, and they have different, different competitive situations. But it is aggravating. We, we had people to stand up out here. We had these first meetings and say we wouldn't go into the HBC if we had to. Uh, had some very good business people that came up and spoke right inside here and said they don't care anything about it because they don't want to go through the nonsense. Well, we all know it's not nonsense, but it is aggravating. And I, and, I, and I think they have both inside and outside have to have the same rules. Now, that's my opinion. The other four people may not even agree with that, and that's fine. But that's what I'd like to do is, is, is look at some way to make the signs the same throughout the historical district and the other district. And, let, and let's throw it out there. I, I just think you're, 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 you're building up. Uh, a problem for business people. And we need businesses downtown in the historical district. Now let me ask you, Mr. Attorney, is that possible to go into the HPC manual or the HPC guidelines and change just that one little part about the signage? And, and, and because if it's not, then I can't go any further. There's nothing I can do. I don't think that it's prohibited. You can certainly do what you want to do from the standpoint of how you want to have your sign ordinance and how you want to have your HPC manual. Yeah. Uh, I think that the issue would be how that may be perceived uh, in the effect of not having any sign regulations in the historic district by the Georgia Department of Nat uh, Georgia Department of Natural Resources. So I don't know how that would be perceived. Deregulating any signage in the historic district, I don't know how that would be taken. I see. Right. And may I add something to your comment? Yes. If you'll read, um, if anyone brought their HPC manual, the Secretary for the Interior's Standards for Treatment of Historic Property, that's the federal government, is very specific about this. And um, it goes through and determines there are the standards for rehab, there is the standards for design. And I think if we do away, to, not only with the state aspect of it, if we do away with it completely, we jeopardize that blessing by the state it flies in the face of everything that's in this manual with regard to what the Secretary of the Interior says. So it, the federal government is involved in this as well as the state. I think that's correct, and I think that that's what, what's, what Ms. Burns would tell you, that there will be, I, I, I can tell you, Mayor, that I believe that there would be issues should we not have any sign regulation you know, in the historic district. I don't know that, uh, but that's certainly something that could be. Well, I didn't mean no sign regulation. All sign regulations would come under you, right, Bert? They all do now. They all Either do now. Way. It right. was just that everybody would come under him rather than the But if you, if, you take, if you take the regulations that are in the HPC guidelines that we have, so our HPC guidelines are, are about as close to the federal set guidelines standards as they come. In okay. fact, I don't know if you remember Ms. Burns saying that they actually use our guidelines many times when they're setting up new communities because it is that well first. I mean, it's that well put together. If you start changing, especially on specific topics that are inclusive, i.e. design, the ones that she just listed, um, then you are jeopardizing exactly what Mr. Eller said in that you can lose that federal grant money opportunities because you you can lose your accreditation, for, so to speak. Signs are something that have always been regulated to some extent within the historic district's specific ways. Um, those sizes were not just pulled out of the air, they were put together, you know, by, by standard through time. And uh, those backlighting or, or <coughs> secondary lighting or indirect lighting, those issues were, were put in there because that is kind of what the federal guidelines states as, as you know, across the country. Um, so it's federal it's, guidelines. It is, and uh, everything you'll find in the HPC guideline, it comes basically from a federal guideline. It does. I mean, they wrote a guideline. It has been copied and modified at different levels in different places. Um, the problem you do run into is that you, know, you do have that, that possibility of, of losing accreditation if you modify too much within certain areas. Signs being one of them, okay? Signs being one, uh, material use another. I mean, there's a list of them, but they're, they're pretty specific in the, in the guidelines. Well, I... I uh, <laughs> Emphasis on, on suggestions. Uh, and I think as a community, we're, we're looking at what's happening right now with the Colony Bike and the Old Lights House. 
most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. And that's from the historic thing right up there in Atlanta, Georgia. They don't live here. They don't buy groceries here. They don't pay taxes here. And I resent it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know the need to be decertified. I certainly want people to be able to get the grant money. It's, it's good. It helps us. But uh, I think when it comes to sign things, I, I think we need to I think we need to test it. I think we need to do it and test it. Because they are just suggestions. And Jamie, you talk about that. equality within the business. There's there's inequality just based on zoning. I mean, it goes back to that basic level. If I want to put an industrial plant on Love Avenue, it doesn't matter if it's in the historic district or not. I can't put an industrial plant there. Um, if I want to put a grocery store on across the street from your house, I can't because zoning prohibits that. That is zoning. Right, that's, 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 that's what I said. Well, this isn't zoning. This is signing. But this you're is signing for businesses. But I want the business to be able to be quality. competitive, whether they're inside the historical district or outside. That's all I'm saying. Well, let's go on because we aren't getting anywhere here. Um, did you ever answer my question? What, what, are we supposed to strike Mariana's comment? Well, I, I would assume so since now she would be you know, no longer on the council and Mr. Ellis would be the one that would be basically taking for District 1 making those decisions. Um, okay. So we won't be discussing her. idea about what council wants to do overall dealing with the idea of illumination in the historic district. Um, I understand Mayor, certainly chapter 7 of our uh, land development code covers all signage throughout the city right. and of course you know the historic preservation manual basically has some uh, confinements or, or changes you know from the land development code which right now just provides for indirect lighting only, which kind of led us to where we are today, uh, including the issue of banners, which we will get to later. And so one of the main issues that, you know, that we first need to address uh, is the idea of illumination and what you think would be appropriate illumination in the historic district. Uh, and Mayor, I think what I'm hearing from you is that you believe <coughs> that illumination in the historic district should be controlled solely by the provisions of Chapter Seven of Land Development Code, and no other you know, and no other no additional restrictions be placed. Is right. that correct? Um, so, I I understand that's the mayor's position. Is there anyone else who wants to discuss that? So we can, because one of the things that, that we were looking towards is that. Um, you know, do we want to do something other than just indirect lighting, which would include things such as channel lighting, ghost lighting, EGD signs. Uh, if we had EGD signs, we wanted to flash, blink, and scroll. So we've got all that out there. We'll talk about illumination in the historic district. So right now, I think the mayor has kind of set forth what his position is. Well, that was option one, right? That's correct. Yeah. Well, option one basically... As, as I wrote it, and, and for y'all's consideration, was that uh, that indirect lighting is generally the most appropriate means for illumination in the historic district. However, other types of illumination could be considered by the HPC on a case-by-case -case basis to, to based upon certain factors that the HPC would look at to determine whether or not different type of illumination would be appropriate, you know, more appropriate in that particular location, such as the neighborhood, the architecture, the type of lighting, and things of that nature. So that's that was option one, is you know, giving the HPC uh, the authority to allow different types of illumination other than indirect on a case-by-case -case basis based upon certain criteria that they would use to determine whether or not, in fact, different types of illumination would be appropriate. Rob, I'm okay with ghost lighting as long as it's, you know, got some sort of boundaries with it, but can you kind of explain the different options for ghost lighting? Ghost lighting, as, as you all may recall, months and months ago, I gave you the sign regulations, I believe it was Salt Lake City, and they had some um, 
illustrations of different types of illumination uh, in the historic district. And ghost lighting is sort of where you have the lighting is from the back of the letters and it just kind of, you know, outlines it. Whereas channel lighting would be where the illumination is actually in the letters themselves. So ghost lighting is kind of a backlit type of lighting where it just kind of, you know, uh, illuminates the letters. The letters stick out from whatever structure they're on right. and so the you, light is behind that, that, right. side, that letter. As opposed to channel lighting, which again just illuminates, you know, the letters or the numbers. And one of the things that, you know, has, uh, that I think historic folks don't like is the, where the light is actually in the box. And it's lighting up the whole box, yeah, the, back, yeah. the, the backlit mm -hmm. signs. So, and, that, and that's why you can start looking at option number two, <coughs> where I said, okay, if you don't want to give, you know, say, give the HPC, uh, you know, the discretion, uh, then you have the option of saying, okay, we're going to allow these particular types of lighting in the historic district, and you can list what you say is okay and what's not be it channel lighting, ghost lighting, EGB signs, uh, backlit signs, whatever you want to do. So what I was trying to, try to do is give you the option to say, listen, let's give this to the HPC, let them determine this on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, based upon set criteria, or you all decide what type of signs and uh, what type of illumination that you want to have in the historic district and put that in your ordinance. And, so you and that's what I district. wanted, right? Pardon? That's what I wanted. Basically, I, I, I'm not real clear, Mayor. Uh, I, I thought that you were good with option one, but it, I'm not, based upon your comments today, I'm not sure that I read your comments correctly. It could be that you don't want a, the HPC to make that determination on a case-by-case -case basis. And so then you're really not in favor of option one. You well, I'm not in favor of option two either. So I guess I just <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with the elimination of different sorts uh, to stay in some sort of guidelines, but I don't I don't like that HPC being able just to just decide on a case by case basis. Okay. Um, I'm okay with option one, Rob. But what we need to do just take a census on each one or what do we need to do? Well, what I was hoping tonight is that, you know, based upon, you know, these issues that have been presented to y'all and your opportunity to look at what other people's position is that has, you know, uh, commented on it, is that you all could have a conversation, discussion about, you know, why, you know, for example, the mayor thinks, I think, you know, chapter seven should apply throughout the city and then, you know, if people want to start talking about what they think is appropriate in the storage district as far as illumination, you can say, I think channel lighting is okay, ghost lighting is okay, interrupt lighting is okay. And then we can at least have this conversation so everybody can kind of flesh out their feelings and, and why they, their position is what it is so you can hear each other, hear from the public and once you've had that discussion. And as I said, then when we get actually to a, a meeting where we can vote, we can take these issues after you've heard you know, you've, after you've fully discussed them among yourselves, heard the citizens' input, and then we can take these issues and vote on what we want to put together to send to Ms. Burns for their review recommendations and ultimately to, uh, to adopt a revised ordinance once we've had the consideration with Ms. Burns has provided to us. So right now, this is just an opportunity for you all to discuss the various ideas of illumination you know, how you think it's appropriate to have signs illuminated in the historic district. And as I said, I think, Mayor, you're okay. You, what you want is whatever is appropriate or allowable out, you know, anywhere in the city. Yeah. And uh, Chris, I think you're saying, I'm good with option one, or perhaps you may be leaning towards identifying exactly what type of illumination you want and actually put that in the ordinance itself. Well, I put that in for option one. Also, I think there was a few things I wanted to delete. Uh, item number six, and I believe five. And I think you'll see.
so that everybody knows what five and six are, we might want to read those. Okay, okay. yeah, hours illumination and sign type. Well, this, what, it, what the factors that I had put in the option one was the nature and character of the neighborhood, <laughs> that is residential, neighborhood, commercial, general business, or commercial downtown. Number two was the location and proximity to other types, sign types. Three, the proximity to residential districts. Four, the effect on the historical integrity of the architecture or neighborhood. Five, the hours of ruination. And six was the sign type and design. And then you had to note, you said this would allow latitude to the HPC, blah, blah, blah. And that was all part of the option one. Well, I said this would allow latitude to HPC to grant a certificate of appropriateness for most any type of illumination depending on certain factors. And then again, should a sign owner feel that the failure to give a certificate of appropriateness was an error, the owner can appeal the decision to city council. So in other words, somebody can you know, ask, go to the HPC, ask for ghost lighting in the event that the, uh, it was not approved by the HPC, they can appeal that to city council. Understand that you know the, that appeal is only for an abuse of discretion. You're not really substituting your judgment for the judgment of the HPC, but only whether or not they abuse their discretion, which is generally a fairly high burden. Okay. Why don't we just go over your list right here that's on the front of this thing? Okay. And that's all five. Just go over it piece by piece. The option one, illumination. Take item number one, the nature and character of the neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. And let's have a consensus on each line. Right? That's, that's fine. I, otherwise, I get real confused. I can't keep up with all that. That's fine. So I think when you, when you look at option number one, before you go down to the factors that you think may be a consideration, the, the general, you know, the, that is with the understanding that we're saying we will give this to the HPC for uh, where they can determine whether or not a different type of illumination should be allowed other than indirect lighting. So you're, you're starting out with the premise, Mayor, that option number one is we're going to let people make application to the HPC for the type of illumination that they want to utilize and that the HPC uh, can you know, deny or approve that request based upon these certain factors. And certainly, just like when the council is making decisions on zoning actions, you, know, you should have specific criteria that you can go by to determine whether or not it's appropriate or inappropriate. And so when I looked at these factors that I placed in here, I was hoping that it's some objective standards that you could use, or the HPC could use, in a determination whether or not a certain type of illumination, a certain location was appropriate or inappropriate. We can change any part of the option one, including the notes you've got there. Absolutely. You can do anything okay. you want to, Mayor. All right. Uh, you want to read the, the heading there that you've got? Uh, and yeah. then we'll start off with number one. All right. The, uh, the heading starts out as this, and this is option number one on illumination in the HPC district. It says, although indirect lighting is the preferred means of illumination, other means of illumination could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Factors to be considered in permitting other means of illumination could include, but not limited to, the following. Number one is the nature and character of a neighborhood, that is residential, neighborhood commercial, general business, or commercial downtown. Okay. Now, how's everybody feel about number one? I noticed that I put down, I didn't have a problem with item number one. I'm fine with one of those. I'm fine with one as long as it's limited to general business or commercial downtown. If it has any aspect of residential to it, whether it's RP, um, strictly residential, whatever, I would not want uh, any type of illuminated sign allowed there. Julie, but what they're saying, what that factor is, is that when the HB... They would take that into consideration. Right, and yeah. they're going to say... Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you're good with the language, and that, but you, you wouldn't want the HPC to be approving anything other than indirect lighting residential districts. That's correct. I would not want them approving that. Yes, that's correct. And I kind of feel like Julie about the residential. Okay. And that's, and again, I think that that's probably going to be the feeling of the HPC folks as well. All right, number two is location and proximity to other sign types. I didn't have anything there. I was okay with that. I'm fine with that. All right. And no, 
number three is the proximity to residential districts. I didn't have a problem with that. Okay. Having said that, I mean, should we do we need to consider some type of buffers or some kind of something? Well, let's don't yeah. let's don't kill anything. Like there, that. there, there, <clears throat> and I know uh, Miss Cassie is no longer on the council, but I think that she did mention something. Um, Love Avenue. Love Avenue. And Twelfth Street. But there again, though, what, what we're talking about here is the, the HPC would take these factors into consideration when they're talking about doing something other than indirectly, indirectly eliminated sign. Correct. Right. For, for instance, so, you could have a business very close to a residence, but because there's a you know a, a, a big buffer in between, it may not affect the resident you know re the residential property in that instance. So even though it may be close to a residence. Because it may have some huge buffer, it may not be a factor that they concern themselves with about granting different a different type of illumination. But it's just a factor they can consider. Rob, in my notes, I had put on here, uh, I had listed an 800 foot buffer. Uh, I think at one point they had put a 500 foot buffer. I don't know if we want to put a foot mark in there or what. How long is a city? A city block is 500 feet, right? Generally. Yeah, I, I know that's four, right. Five, that's, yeah. Basically, five hundred. Basically, four, four or five hundred. Yeah. Four, five, yeah. Right at five hundred. Typically speaking. Typically speaking. Yeah. So we saw five. Kind of think about that. So uh, that's five hundred feet. Whole Chris, block. I think that comment on the buffer mm -hmm. that way had to do with the EGD signs, city right. line, and okay. not the historic district. Okay. Um, uh, the fourth factor. <coughs> would be the effect on the historical integrity of the architecture or neighborhood. Okay, what I had there was the, uh, in between historical and integrity, was to add architectural as well. And, uh, and then scratch out of the architecture or the neighborhood. Maybe that doesn't make sense to you. If it doesn't, I'll, I'll skip over that. I just have it on my notes to remove the part that said of the architecture of the neighborhood because I included it, the effect on the historical architectural integrity. So I just changed the sentence to what it did, maybe shorter and simple. I think you did. I think my reading of what you sent to me, Mayor, was number four would read the effect on the historical architectural integrity. Yes. And that was period versus yes. what I have here. I have no. But I can go either way on that. So can we say four is okay? I don't have a problem with four. You want I to scratch would, out or neighborhood? I would like to leave or neighborhood in. I think that's, um, personally, I think that's important to keep that in. What did you say about or neighborhood? Uh, leave it in. What, what we scratch that? Well, I think Merritt had, had taken it out. I think that because he was reworking the sentence, and again, yeah, still had neighborhood what architecture. I think the intent, Mary, is that you wanted to uh, affect the effect in, on the historical architectural integrity of the neighborhood, just not have architecture of the neighborhood. Is that correct? Yeah. That neighborhood was still in there. I think number four is dealing with two things. Of the neighborhood. Leave it in. No, no, no. Just leave neighborhood in. Right. We're talking about the same thing, just sitting there. Right, because one you're talking about the architecture of the building, the other you're talking about the neighborhood as a whole. Yeah, yeah. what I said, that's the neighborhood. Yeah. Okay, we're good. And if, yeah. uh, number five is the hours of illumination. Oh, no, okay. Well, and the reason why I had to leave on my notes is because it's, uh, you know, the HPC could permit these could include, but not limited to. You know, if the hours aren't going to be appropriate for the character of the neighborhood, which is in number one, they're not going to be approved for anyway. So I felt like that was a little redundant. That's why I had it struck out. You were struck out number five? Mm -hmm. That's why I had it struck out my notes. And again, uh, these are just some enumerated factors for them to consider. Um, <coughs> 
whatever y'all want to do. Well, I had it number five, the hour of elimination. I didn't strike it all out. I said to add with longer daylight days to rule. In other words, you wouldn't have, you just have a certain amount. In the wintertime, your days are shorter. Summer, your days are longer. Right. Just a little common sense there. And I think this is kind of goes to uh, maybe uh, Mr. Stack's, uh, actually sign where he was only going to have it on certain hours. And that may be something that would be, that would be considered right. by the HPC to determine whether or not that sign would be okay. So are we going to leave it number five, just the hour of elimination? Depending on the okay. daylight time. I mean, I, I'm okay with it. I just thought it was a little redundant, you know, because we've already got up here the nature and character of the neighborhood. <coughs> I don't see why you put it in there because of the <coughs> events. So I, I can see why you, oh. you did that. So can we add daylight hours? Change the daylight hours? So we're more specific? Yes. Okay. Is everybody okay? Mm -hmm. So we're going to hours of illumination to daylight hours? Yeah, why wouldn't we actually have it as hours of illumination? During daylight, is that what we're going to do? Well, we're, we're yeah, with longer daylight days to rule, is what I ask. I think where you're going to wind up with this thing is we go into daylight saving time because everybody right. gets dark, so it's 8 30, 9 o'clock at night, as long as it gets dark. Uh, if we don't put a time specific time in there, it's going to be very difficult for code enforcement to enforce any, any lighting rules, if you will. Sunset? Yeah, we can use the. Uh, the, uh, whatever sunset is for the, you know, whatever the, the official sunset is. Well, the sunset would follow the daylight savings with the longer day. That's right. But, but whatever time is determined that the sun sets that particular day, you know, the news comes out, the weather reports come out and say sunrise at such and such a time, sunset such and such a time. Bert, just wait till it's dark. That's pretty detailed. Bert, are you going to keep it going? But, you know, I mean, the bottom line is, is going, anything that's, that's done, done and that was always my first comment, and everyone that's read every report that's came from me says that, you know, our department prefers things to be enforceable. Because if they're not enforceable, they're not good ordinance. I mean, sure. they're just not. So a set time is the easiest way to do it. And, and I understand that times change, but if you set times, um, you know, if a store is open from 8 in the morning to 10 at night, let's just say, I mean, I know it's a long, but a, 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 a drugstore, say open those hours you know what it would be is that you basically just don't want them with their lights on all night long you see what I'm saying I mean, where they leave them on even if the business is shut down so to come up with a specific time frame you know six to ten it gives everybody I don't mean they have to run them that long but it just means that'd be the maximum within that district then you're not interfering with the with the neighborhoods that do butt up to the residentials. What is our noise ordinance right now? 10 p.m. I was just thinking. 10 p.m. And, and if you tied it to that, which is why if I said we already have that in place, right. then makes it easy. Okay. Makes it important. Most businesses, if they close anyway, they're going to be closed prior to that. Right. That's right. So what are we going to do with six. restaurants and things like that that are downtown that would be open after 10 if we do approve um, uh, you know, indirect lighting or something for the commercial area? That Good mean a question. Would have to shut their lights off at 10? If you don't make it specific to that district or specific to you know that, then yes, you do have an issue with that. Right. Because I, I could see some businesses that would well, need that whichever comes first. That's true. It would be a case by case. Maybe that's we don't need to get into case. the hours right. after all. Well, and that's why I had it struck because it seemed a little redundant of one and a little too detailed because the district is so diverse. Well, ma no, I'm saying maybe leave it in there, but we don't be so specific with, just say consider the hours of illumination for the type of business in the location, but not limit it to couldn't 10 p.m. or something. Couldn't the certificate of appropriateness address the time in which the sign could be on? Yeah. Because it may be, you know, what might be appropriate on Tift Avenue, you know, or what may be appropriate downtown may not right. be appropriate on Tift Avenue. Right. So I think when you get your certificate of appropriateness, that will spell out. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be a difficult, might be a nightmare for Bert, but as long as everybody's complying with their COA, then it won't be his first night. No. <laughs> we'll do the last either, really. I just want to be sure that when the time changes, the days are longer. That, that part's covered. That's okay. okay. Right. And I think with the, with the consideration of hours of illumination, it should be a consideration because yeah. on specific types of signs, you know, depending on what you allow later on. You see what I'm saying? I mean, right. if you were to allow an, an LED sign later on, and I'm not saying you will or won't, but if you do, then that sign may need to be regulated at some level as to the hours of business or whatever the case may be. And I mean, 
common sense is common sense, but then running it all night long, 24-7, may not be the best option for the historic district as a whole, is what I guess is what I'm saying. But when they uh, issue a COA, do you get a copy of that? I actually, you, I do them. So oh, I mean, do I mean they, okay. they do them, but I'm, I generate the COAs, yes. Okay. So. Um, so there is a way for you to be able to track them if it is yes. wild. Okay. Yes, we have them tracked on a computer to start with, so there is a possibility we could do some tracking with that, right? Okay. The, the next item is number six, as far as factors to consider for illumination is the sign type and design. Um, this is a little bit more of a uh, sticky wicket. I guess the, the question that you have, or the HPC people would have, is whether or not um, these EGD signs should be allowed in the historic district. And if you want to allow those type of electronic graphic display signs in the historic district, what are you going to let, how are you going to let them <coughs> Change? Are you going? Do you want? Let, are you going to let them flash, blink, scroll? <coughs> How do you want the? You know, you want a type of time frame in between the changing of the displays. So, this is where I think council is going to need to try to make a decision. Is there any type of sign that you want? You do not want in the historic district, or? If there's a type of sign that you think may be appropriate in some parts of the historic district and not in others, then how do you want to regulate where those signs could be? Specifically, the EGD signs. Do you want to let EGD signs to be in the historic district? First question. And if you do, then do you want them to be permitted throughout the historic district? And the, the answer is no. Then the next issue is, where do you want them to be, and how do you want to regulate those? Well, I tell you, I, I don't really care for the strobing or the blinking really fast. It could be, it could cause a problem, you know. Um, but that's just me. I think the strobing and the blinking, you know, could be. Well, Chris, maybe if I could ask you, sort of the thing rolling, as far as the EGD signs. Do you see that they would be appropriate anywhere in the historic district, or do you see it more appropriate to limit those locations within the historic district? I mean, I think they can be done in a classy way. I mean, you can see them all around. That's kind of the next wave in technology. More and more businesses are going to start using those type of signs. You know, are done standard where they just have an image or maybe whatever, and then maybe they change, like the old timing type, but they just have better graphics. I think the way to go. You know, but to have something that's just in your face doing something like that, I think that would distract from the neighborhood and seeing it. So, and what I've heard in the past is that I thought most folks didn't want those in residential, residential professional. <coughs> I mean, is that, is your feeling that it doesn't matter that they could be anywhere? I guess as long as there's guidelines for them. But definitely not, you know, doing anything crazy like strobing and blinking and the bright flashing for sure. So Chris, are you saying you would allow EG EGD signs? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. You just don't want the With black some limitations, flashing, right. right. strobing and all that kind of stuff. With some limitations. Okay. I think that's what I think too. The CBS, that sign, the CBS. Electronic graphic display. Is that, is that considered? Mm -hmm. yes. It's like an LED, it's an upgraded LED sign. Yeah, like and almost like having a monitor, you know, a, a graphic yeah. monitor. Yes, yeah, it's kind of class. You can make it do whatever you want it to do. But Mariana, our last meeting, we talked about it. She used an example of, uh, I think, was it a bank? It was Bojangles. Or Bojangles. No, it was a bank. No, that was a Maris Bank. Maris Bank on the corner of 20th and Old Bank. That they had it. Oh, so. And I think it was, and she actually oh, met with them. They had like a dimensional oh, thing. Yeah. Right. Oh, and they had a real. It would be good. Thing where they had <laughs> images and stuff like that, it was done professionally. So, and that's kind of what I'm going off of. I mean, if it can be done professionally without all the, yeah, if it's done classy, you know, I think it could be appropriate. But let me ask you, are you saying that that would be okay in a residential district as well? 
residential neighborhood. But the boundary, yeah. Say that again, Chris. Okay. Um, I'm in favor of the electronic display signs uh -huh. as long as they're not strobing and blinking and flashing. They're not, you know, doing all this mess. Yeah. Uh, and they've got some limitations and boundaries on how many times they could change and other things that we're, we're discussing. Okay. We were discussing the marriage thing. Mm -hmm. Right. <coughs> and so we were using that as an example yeah. that it's already, there's already signs out there that are doing that now. Uh, and so we've already got them out there. And that's kind of the next wave in technology. More and more people will start to go to those type signs and right. less of the old analog type signs. <coughs> Billboards, you know, that have lights that, that blink, you know, this way for an ad or whatever. Yeah. So it's going to happen. So we're going to address it now and get a plan for it because more and more people are going to start purchasing these type signs. Yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at with that. And he's okay with it in the historic district. So I'll, I'll agree with what he just said. And that's an issue that the HPC can. So you're saying delete. Uh, well, I think Rob was just asking about the other signs in general. Basically, as I as, as I understand it, the way this would work is that if the the council would not limit the type of sign that could be in the historic district, it could be any type of sign, but whether or not a EGD sign would be permitted in the historic district would be left up to the HPC based upon the factors that we just went through. And I think that's the thing. If, if it's not going to be appropriate to, you know, that residential section or maybe it's too close, the HPC is going to recognize that anyway. Right. You know, so, I mean, items one through four is going to take care of that sign if it's not going to be correct anyway. Um, that's kind of where I was coming at. That's fine. So basically you're saying that <coughs> everything is fair game in the, in the historic district, um, but it's going to have to meet, the, it's going to go before the HPC. They're going to consider these factors, make a determination whether or not it's appropriate or not appropriate. I, I disagree with that. I don't want any of these EGD or LED, whatever you want to call them, signs in the historic district, period, in any district. I have no problem going back to the backlit, you know, the, the halo lighting or, you know, those kind of things, but this flash of scrolls, blinks, whatever, I, I would not be in favor of that. Okay. Is there any other discussion on this? So the way I'm looking at this now is that everybody's pretty much in agreement on option number one, allowing the HPC to determine a different type of illumination other than indirect lighting um, on a case-by-case -case basis by utilizing the factors that we just went through. And I also understand that, that uh, Julie, you don't want LED or EGD signs in the historic district, period. How do we address this issue? How do we address the issue then of, of locations within the historic district that already have LED signs? Why can't they just be grandfathered in and from that point forward? like you do. I'm going to go back and use zoning. I know that is considered an inappropriate example, but I'm going to use zoning. When zoning changes, the zoning stays the same until a change takes place. So there maybe they're grandfathered in until that business changes or the property sells or something like that, and then it comes under the new guidelines. Just a suggestion. So I, know, I just know that was an issue that we were trying to deal with, with while we were revising the but it's no different. We have things now that are, that are not in compliance with compliance with the new land development code that were grandfathered in. Right. So that LDC does address, it does reference the historic district. So anything that happened prior to that is grandfathered in. As things change, as the property changes, business changes, ownership, whatever, anything that triggers now for it to come into compliance, then it would have to come into compliance with the new business owner or whatever that trigger is. Yeah. Okay, so I number six. Uh, Julie feels a little different than Chris and I feel, so we just need to talk to John and Wes. Um, my, my opinion on that is uh, I, you put it in there, I can pretty much guarantee that Ms. Burns and her group is going to strike that as part of her recommendations. Um, so why put it in there? Why am I against it? Each of these signs. 
Miss Burns in the audience. Miss Burns lives in Atlanta. I'm not really worried about that. If she wants to strike it, she well, can. I understand that. I'm thinking of uh, our developers that want to develop a commercial property here <coughs> in Tiffin who may, may want to take advantage of those grants or tax credits to do the renovation to the building. Um, it's going to be very hard or difficult to, to or a developer want to spend his money if he's going to do a renovation and, and it would be an incentive that why they're, they're giving to us an incentive for us to uh, do these changes or, or do these renovations or get the developers to develop a historic building. Well, the DNR historical division uh, would have to disqualify uh, our zoning, I mean, our, our guidelines. They would have to disqualify. I just don't think we're going to do that. I, mean, I think we ought to test it at least before we just roll over and play dead. One other thing that, that probably needs to be considered when you talk about um, EGD size in the historic district might be the size. Um, you may want to think about it, see if you have some type of limitation in the historic district on the size of your EGD display. But I think that is I so I think we can move on to the next issue. Well, we hadn't heard one person on those. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right now it's kind of two and two. I'm sorry. I I was just go ahead. Well, doing it as you like you said, my grandfather there. Um, maybe maybe that works. Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. But if you if you grandfather it in, or uh, when a new business comes, if, if the old business that has it now, and you put it in, and, or you don't put it in, when the new if a new business comes, if it's grandfathered, then it automatically goes in, right? Well, there would be triggers in place. Like right now, if um, triggers would be, and Larry, you may have to help me this, or Bert, if an ownership changes. So if I, if I sell my business and you buy my business, that, that I was under the old guidelines, but yeah. now you come in and buy my property and you're, I had Julie's widget shop and you're gonna have you know, Johnny's nuts and bolts shop or whatever, you would now have to come under the new guidelines as they would be. But as long as Julie's widget shop was there, I could operate under the old, my signage could be under the old, that kind of thing. But there would, we would have to determine what those triggers would be, change of ownership, change of uh, ownership of the business, change of ownership of the property, those kind of things. I mean, that could be, just like we do with zoning, that can be identified. Mm -hmm. Sure. Pollution. Okay. Light pollution. And that's restricting. <coughs> that, did you say that's restricting business? Yeah. You know, I want it equal. How I said that at the very beginning. Yes. I, I, I want equal signing in the historical district and outside the district. You do this, and there's going to be severe restrictions uh, for the people that want to do business inside the historical district, and I just disagree with that. I guess my feeling is, at least put it in there as an option with limitations, like I said, but let the HPC decide whether it's appropriate or not. I guess that's kind of where I'm at, you know, and I don't think Ms. Burns is going to strike that down because there's checks and balances in place. Um, and that's just kind of where I'm at. That way it gives them the option if it's appropriate. You gotta think about it. who's gonna have these signs? You know, probably not a very small business. Who's gonna have these signs are gonna be you know, large companies that are gonna abide by the rule and they're gonna get with Burke first and do everything to the letter of the law. So I mean, it's gonna be somebody that we can work with anyway that on these type of very expensive signs. So that's kind of my position, is at least put it, the option in there with you know, some pretty stringent guidelines, but then let the HPC decide whether it is allowable or not in that specific case-by-case -case basis if they ask for it. Well, the, the other thing Bert just brought to my attention, which we've all talked about before, Article 7 and about 17 in the Land Development Code, uh, we, we have this thing called light pollution. pollution and uh, that's probably gonna take care of a lot of the issues regarding any residential or residential professional districts says you can't have the brick and scroll and fight and flashing, nor can you cast illumination onto adjacent property. So that'll help, you know, quell any issues when it comes to the And the then we'll go back to that guideline anyway. That's from right. From their decision making. Right. So 
that's why I'm saying I, I think we're going to be taken care of here, you know, regardless. But uh, what I might suggest is a number six. We could add uh, size. We'll say the side type, comma size and design. That way, you know, HBC, you know, clear that they can take into consideration how big the sign is going to be. And I think that what I'm, I, I believe that uh, Chris, you're probably correct, is that. I don't know, Wes, that we'd be having a whole lot of trouble with DNR because I don't think DNR is going to say you can't have any EGD signs, but if you have some control over the limitations and factors as far as when it, that's being determined by the HPC, I think that may fly. But if you're striking out six, like we some of you suggested. Well, I don't think we're going to strike it at this point. Right. Yeah, she did say her, her she did say that uh, it was detrimental to the district. She didn't I like very the idea. Clearly I, remember that. I, I, I agree. My, um, since you mentioned size of signs, um, can I ask a question? And this was something um, when Marianne and I were working on this and going over all this that we discovered that the, and I don't know if this is the time to fix this or not, so I'm going to throw it out there. Signs within the historic district are allowed to be larger than signs outside the historic district based on the new land development code. So if you want types, equality, let's make it equal. That is true. I mean, and so why are that? Why is that? Well, because the historic guidelines were pretty well were set. Were in place before. Right, and so. and we didn't play with them too much yeah. when we were changing things. Um, so right now, the, the the thing is, is you know, when you talk about equality, mm -hmm. there's not equality in the rest of the city no, because not. you have areas that you can't put a. A billboard. You have right. areas that you can't put a sign over 40 feet. You can't exactly. go to the 80. You have areas you can go to 80. And you have areas you can't go to 80. You have areas you can have a certain size and areas you can't have a certain size. So it's it's variant throughout the city. Exactly. And it was set up that way mainly by requests that came for a lot from y'all actually to protect specific areas. And um, so there's not equality, nor will there ever be. No offense to, you just can't because you've got certain areas that require more signage and allow more signage i.e. 75 quarter is a prime example of but with that being said there are definitely types of signs that are allowed in the historic district on a larger basis on a larger basis but on a limited larger basis yeah. i mean the, the size is bigger but but there's limitations on other things it can't sure. be over a certain height it can't right. be over a certain design you know so i mean there's some variations there that where yes you could put a bigger it may sign be more favorable to be in the correct. historic district that's, that's correct if that's your perception that is correct okay i just want to bring that up well, then we need to make signs outside the historic district a little larger, too. But that'll give you equal quality. Okay. That's what we're talking about. Give the offenses a good, fair chance. Let's that's, that's make those bigger. We, like you said, we're the ones that can make that decision. Absolutely. So let's fix that. You tell me how big you want them, we'll make them that size. Well, let's just don't have it so that the historic district can have them any bigger. And all be the same size. So, Ron, number six, we're going to put sign type, comma size, and design. Yes. And I, uh, now, so are we agreeing that you can't have the, the EGD signs, LED, QED? Is that what we're saying? No, I think. I mean, we're, I think there's there's been a discussion, and I think Julie's saying that she does not want EGD signs anywhere in the historic district. I think that um, I think Chris is, and and you, Bear, are saying I think they should be allowed. You know based upon HPC approval. And Johnny, I'm not quite, what do you think? I, 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 I'm gonna excuse me from that. Okay. I'm good. And uh, do you have an opinion I, at this I, point? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I still feel that uh, there's So that's, I think we've heard basically everybody on that issue. Do you want to move on to banners? I mean, how do we fix this? Yeah. Well, basically what I, as I stated, is that what I would propose is that when we have, we'll have a special called meeting after the workshop on <coughs> Thursday, the 16th, if everyone's prepared to address the issue, and then we will have, you know, have a formal <coughs> vote on a proposed draft to a letter to, to Ms. Burns concerning our position on various issues. And I think the, 
best way to accomplish that is as we are doing it tonight. Take one issue, having to deal with the illumination and signs in the historic district, and have a determination to, and a vote on this is what we would like to present to Ms. Burns, is what we would propose to amend our ordinance. Then we go on to the issue of banners. Because I think to try to do everything at one time, we just get very complicated trying to make amendments to the main motion and things of that nature. So that's what I would think that you know, we, we have this, you know, we actually have a consensus toward, you know, by vote, as far as what we want to do is to each one of these issues in preparation of a proposed letter to Ms. Burns as far as this is what council proposes to do, revising their signed ordinance and HPC manual, and then get that feedback from them. Totally. So, we, so I guess, Mary, the bottom line is we've discussed this issue. Everybody has heard council, uh, other council members, so we'll go on to the banners issue and see that. Uh, yeah, and, and option two is out, right? I mean, that's. Correct. I think that everybody's in agreement with option one. Yeah. And so we're, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, now where is your, where is your data in here on that? I think there. I don't see it. It's on page four. That's all the color stuff. Is. Oh, here it is. I can look back at this. I guess that's number four. No, that's city limit issues. Here it is. Banners on. Uh, okay. Here it is. I don't know what page it is, but it's got me <coughs> name. It's where Chris has his answer. And it's got banners down. There. Okay. Now. Everybody on that page. <coughs> uh, quick history. We had um, talked about banners in the historic district, and I think at one point we had determined, and I think we had decided one per lot at one point in time, uh, up to 24 square feet. And so the question that I have naturally as to banners is, should you allow them? How many per lot? What size? And do you want them to be horizontal, vertical, or allow both? And I think most folks were on the same page <coughs> with that, was being in favor of one banner per lot, 24 square feet, either horizontal or vertical. Yeah, horizontal or vertical. I'm a, I didn't list the footage on mine, but I'll give it one banner and 24 is fine with me. So we have a consensus on banners. Fine. Now, let me just ask you over to pit stop. <coughs> pit stop, is that the city limits? Yes, sir. I thought it was. They have a banner about every 10 feet. Is that going to affect them? Well, again, and I, I even hate to mention this, but everywhere else in the city, they're allowed two banners maximum. If he's got up more than two, then he needs to take them down. And I will address that in the morning. But. Uh, and tell him that you sent me over there. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they're, they're, but, they, <laughs> but I will. I, but the bottom line is, is in the rest of the city we allow two banners, 24 square feet. But in the historic district, we were requesting for one, and that was the consensus within okay. all of the meetings yeah, that we right. had for months on end. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm fine. I'm fine. With that. But it can be horizontal. It, that never has mattered to us. That's the only thing I have on here. Take it away. Yeah, boy, that was a quick one. Oh. <laughs> the next uh, issue was stick signs. And stick signs, yes, sir. I Everybody think buy that on your list? Stick signs. Page. That's the next page. This is where um, at, we had originally had some consensus as to five stick signs per lot uh, with a total square footage of 10 square feet. And then, as you all may recall, this was one of the issues that came up when we were talking with Ms. Burns, and uh, she suggested um, perhaps a, as an alternative the sandwich signs versus the stick signs as being perhaps more appropriate. So then I've, I've got, uh, of course, we, then I have your responses, and it appears that most folks, that you know, everybody responded seem to come down from the five and to a lesser number. I put smaller lots up to two, larger lots up to three. Right. Common sense question. I'm okay with two. 
I think five could be too many. Um, you know, as far as on number one, and then your question on number two, Rob, I'm, I guess I'm fine with up to 10 square feet total. And then number three, the sandwich signs as defined by the LDC as an A-frame sign. I'm fine with that. Um, and the dimensions, you know, of 18 inches wide and three feet high. So if, uh, does everybody feel, and I think, Julie, you may have even commented that as far as these type of signs, I think you compared save a lot to a Looking at the size of the lot that the business is located on, yeah, I compared, you know, save a lot. Five signs might be perfectly appropriate, but if you were at the office next door, which is a much smaller lot, five signs would overwhelm that lot. So um, I, I, I would prefer the sandwich boards. I could, I could, as a, you know, you know, air compromise or whatever, I could, um, I could be okay with the stick signs, but I think five is too many. Um, I think it should be based on the lot size. And, and if we need to s specify a number, I think Chris's suggestion of two per lot is, is perfectly appropriate if, if we are to allow the stick signs. But I so prefer the sandwich signs. So speaking on the size again, I don't know what's wrong with the smaller lots having a, a, a two and the larger lots having three. I mean, you do have some lots that are a lot wider, don't you, Bert? Yes, yeah, so there's lots from an acre down to. Right. So, I mean, Tenth of an acre, three, three, so you got them all over the place, yes, sir. <coughs> Rather than just cut them down to two, even on a big lot. About common sense. I mean, you just have to designate the square footage you consider to be large versus the square footage you consider yeah. to be small. Yeah, the Mary, do you have some some idea as far as where that delineation would be between small and large? Well, no, I don't. I, I just know there's smaller lots on the way. I can tell you this that um, when we're looking at at signage as a whole yeah. without throughout the city the delineation between what we consider to be a small lot and a, a mid-sized to large lot is 30,000 square feet which is about two-thirds of an acre mm -hmm. little, give or take three-fourths of an acre 0. 0.7 something of that nature see it's not so much the square footage because you could have a narrow one it's real real long but it, it, it's how much frontage you got. I think it would be. Well, you could do it on length of frontage if you prefer. Yeah, I, I think that's, you, got you know, that's something to consider. Small frontage, two maximum. If you've got a much larger frontage, let them have three. But I disagree with five. I don't see what's wrong with that. What's the, you might have a solution for you. Okay. <clears throat> the earth's only. Mm -hmm. It's got minimum it does. frontage. Mm -hmm. It varies, but I mean, it yeah. does. It could be set up on that. That's, that's what. what there's a minimum amount of frontage in the, the in the zoning standards we have in the land development code. Yeah, there is. Uh, so if you're in, uh, I don't. Know, well, like for example, smallest right. the largest. If you go right. in, if you're in residential, professional, for example, or general business, the, the minimum footage is 60 feet. That's correct. That's correct. So that's general business. So if you want to have 60 feet of road frontage, then obviously you don't need five signs out there. Uh, residential, professional is 100. No, it's not that big, right? Not residential professional. Anyway, it's, but it's we could take that if it's okay with council. Let give us a chance to look at the the road frontage for zoning yeah. and see if we can tie that to this to determine what's a large or a small okay lot. With that and it would be based on frontage. I yeah, mean, truly really on that's road frontage. I mean, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's all I'm talking about. Two yeah. and three. That's up to your discretion. I just didn't want to limit it to only two. Right. Regardless of two. Five or two is too many. I think five four is too many. many. I think three or larger lots is too many. I, I still say I'd like to see it at just around two because we're also talking about they can have a banner too. So it's other signs too, but I, that's fine. I can, I can go along with what y'all are researching. Yeah, you would bring that to the workshop on the 16th. Mm -hmm. All right. Eight frames. The Do they think they're not going to allow a frame in the rest of the historic district other than where they're at now? A frames are just downtown. just commercial downtown. Okay, uh, let's talk about the a frames. Where, where are they? Is it my stick signs? Same, yeah. same. I know, but where, where are they on here? Obviously, right under there. Alternative, 
Understate signs, number three, understate yeah. signs. It's still understate signs, man. It was the alternative. Oh, I see, number three, okay. I think one of the, what, what my understanding was the conversation with Ms. Burns was that you may consider not having stick signs and using sandwich boards as an alternative. But one of the things that uh, Burns reminded me, we only have, we only allow a frame sandwich board signs downtown commercial, and do we want to allow those throughout the historic district? And um, quite frankly, I'm not sure why we limit it just to downtown. Can, can I make a suggestion? Yes. I mean, I'm just, this is a, a, a suggestion, and it is this. You know, I think that, that really, and it goes back to what you're saying, Mayor, about equality, I think that sandwich board signs are very usable. They're actually a better choice, not a matter than a stick sign. But here's the thing. If you're going to allow stick signs, then what I would recommend, and this is a staff recommendation for myself, would be that include stick or A-frame type signs throughout the historic district. So in other words, they would allow two signs if they want to use a stick sign and a A-frame sign or two A-frame signs of that 18 by three feet that's already there within. The, it allows for more options within that district, for more options for your businesses, but yet still doesn't overwhelm with too many signs. Um, so you could have a you know, five square foot um, stick sign and if you had two on the narrow lot, a A-frame sign if you chose to, or two A-frame signs. It gives them the flexibility to use signage that they prefer. Um, a lot of people are liking the A-frame signs because they're changeable. <coughs> you can change the, 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 the message on them easily. And um, I think giving everybody across the historic district in the businesses that opportunity would benefit the district and businesses as a whole. Um, right now we do it within the downtown because there is no place to stick a sign up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there is no right of I mean, everything's in the right of way. There's no it's all concrete. Yeah, it's called asphalt or concrete. So we use those signs exclusively like there for that. But it just gives everybody a little better option throughout the historic district if they're allowed to have choose a limit of two or three, depending on lot size. Um, and it could be two stick signs or two A-frame signs. Or one of each. Or one of each. Right. You know, all you'd have to do is combine stick and or any combination, any combination there are between a stick and an A-frame. And if you had a wider, lot as we talked about, you could have two A's and one stick. Correct, if you had a wide lot, wherever we determine that to be. Okay, yeah, I like that. Did, did, we, uh, everybody else did we determine that the maximum number of signs is going to be three? No, y'all are supposed to. We started we're putting, it putting it on there. No, 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 no. We're talking about the size of the lot, but I know Chris said the uh, maximum was two. Uh, her, if we're, if we're going to put a number on it, because we've had five in here just as a suggestion. And I heard Chris say two, and somebody else said three. Chris say three or a larger lot. Okay, so lot. Is that the maximum number of signs? And is three the maximum yeah. number of signs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two on a small lot, three on a large lot. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. That's acceptable. Yeah, I'm okay. 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 Just want to be clear. Good. Good. Okay. Clarification. I think that moves us out of the historic district and into the main, uh, into the city limit issues. And I think that what we were asking council to consider was how you wanted to handle these uh, electronic graphic display signs. And again, these electronic graphic display signs come in all shapes, sizes. Um, and what we were trying to find out is how do you want to um, regulate these EGD signs? And of course, the questions were where to allow them. Do you want to limit distances from one to the other? Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we are. Let me just um, let me just kind of read the first. We'll go down to each question, okay? Um, it says we developed a proposed amendment to the LDC to regulate multiple message signs. It appears with dealing with LED signs would be more appropriate to define and regulate electronic graphic display signs. Since this is a fairly new and evolving technology, the regulation of these signs are few and evolving. I have reviewed some of the other city ordinances regulating EGD signs, and as a result, I developed the following questions that need to be answered by council as to the manner of regulating these type of signs, if at all. A sample definition of an EGD sign is an electronic graphic display sign is a sign or portion thereof that displays electronic static images 
static graphics or static pictures with or without information, text, defined by a small number of matrix elements using different combinations of light emitting diodes, fiber optics, light bulbs, or other illumination devices within the display area, where the message change sequence is accomplished immediately or by means of fade, repixelization, or dissolve modes. Electronic graphic display signs include computer programmable, microprocessor controlled electronic or digital displays. Electronic graphic display signs include projected images or messages with these characteristics onto buildings or other objects. All signs whose message is displayed by light emitting diodes or LED, fiber optics or light bulbs are considered EGD signs even if they only contain text. So as you can see, this is a, you know, there's a wide variety of different types of EGD signs. I think that, uh, you know, I'm sure you all have traveled up I-75, I mean right now you can see a billboard that is almost like a TV uh, picture. So that's what these signs are now have developed into, and as I said, you know, I have looked and tried to research other cities that have regulated these signs, and they're very few and far between. So um, the question first was to council where to allow EGD signs. And that's question number one. Do we well, I'll go first. I had, I had uh, first of all, I said kill the sign map, but I don't know why I wouldn't kill the sign map. It just sounded too, not too much trouble. Um, then I just, I just had to specify the districts. I had, I had zoning of C, D, G, B, and C. I just had those three. Because that gets where, that, that takes care of your commercial, your general business. Just for informational reasons, right now uh, within the city, our ordinance reads in a way that, um, with the exception of light pollution, um, 7.17, that we allow LED or EGD. EGD signs pretty much as long as they're within the signage allowance for that area. So in other words, if they're allowed a freestanding sign, you know, of, of even 60 square feet, let's say, um, they're allowed that. If they're allowed a wall sign, you know, comparing the size of their building, which is what makes consideration, they're allowed that now. Um, the things that we don't have the regulations on are not so much whether we allow them or not. It's a matter of whether we're going to allow them everywhere or how long we're going to let them flash and how bright we're going to let them be. I mean, those are the, the main three criteria that really need to be answered for my department. Because right now, if somebody comes in, I mean, I get them every day and I approve them every day without question because, well, with the exception of the historic district, of course, but I mean, right now, but I mean, within the city as a whole. And, you know, those are things that, uh, you know, we did some, some illumination checks through town, um, had some, one of our residents to help with that, and, and um, one of our business people, and, and came up, you know, they're, they're not terribly bright, you know, I mean, they're, they're not abusively bright as a rule, although they could be. Some do flash and blink and strobe like you're talking about, which I think could be an issue. It could be a traffic issue, really. Um, the scrolling doesn't seem to be quite as much of an issue. You know what I mean? As long as it's consistent. Um, even the changing of, of messages, you know, I've watched some of those signs and they vary all over the place and that's not as big of an issue. But the issue is, is that, you know, do you want it to remain like it is, which is pretty much, we allow them anywhere, you know, they can be I mean, because, you know, we have a pretty free, anybody ever comes to Tipton will tell you, we have a pretty free sign ordinance. I mean, we really do for businesses. 
and, and it was designed that way, where they can choose and pick what they want. And, and I want to keep it that way, because that, I think, draws a lot of business here, Mayor. I mean, I really do think that that's a big me me measure. At the same time, um, do we want to have signs, you know, almost as big, up to 300 feet, which is possible, that are LED, you know, or EDG, or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, and do we want them to be playing, you know, television or video? Do we want them to be flashing and blinking and strobing, as, as, as Mr. Perry has mentioned? Do we want them real close to residential areas that we've talked about? You know, um, that's where the bottom line, that's, that's where it pans out to, really, when you get right down to it. Right now, we allow them, and it's not that big of a deal to my department, I mean, you know, from a standpoint, um, with the exception of knowing that in the future, as things do develop, and change, as you said, it's a new technology and it's coming down the pipe. Um, do we want to limit the size of an LED sign? Or do we want to just allow it to be up to 300 square feet, which is what it could be right now? Um, do we want to allow it to be as bright as we want to be as long as it's not shining on a neighbor, which is very difficult to do, by the way, I mean, when you think about it. So, I mean, those are the questions that come up. Some of those we can regulate from within with what we have now, some we can't, one being size. You know, if that's an option for, I'm just throwing that out as something to think about. Um, I still go back to what I originally said, and I will say it again, and I'll say it no matter how this pans out, that the flashing, the blinking, the strobing can be an issue. It's gonna be an issue with your neighbor. It's gonna be an issue with traffic. It already is. And um, that's gonna be an issue. And so what Mr. Parrott mentioned about, you know, kind of doing away with that part of it, I think is great, where it's a gradual change. You know, like Thank you were talking about, where it, it flows and where it's not distracted. And those are just going to be judgment calls that my department's going to have to make sometime. And you know what I'm, I mean, that's, that's why, you, why you got us here, is to make some of those calls. But I do not want to restrict business with this either. I'm just throwing it out there because we're on a pretty good roll right now. I don't want to stay on that roll. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I think it would be, I, I don't know where, but <clears throat> as far as the size, we have ordinances in place already that control the size of any sign. Okay? Now, my question to the council is, if we look at a billboard, let's say it's a 300 square foot billboard, what's the difference between having a 300 square foot EGD sign and a 300 square foot billboard because you've got a thousand watts of lights shining up on that sign that's lit up like daylight. So is there really any that much difference between an EGD sign as long as you can control, control And I think we looked at the law on this too. There's a law that says they are for the it cannot be a change over a certain interval. But as far as the sign, and, and I agree with Bert, you know, we've got the regulation in place already. So the question is, is there any difference between an EGD sign as far as brightness, because we control that also, and a regular billboard out there. I'll just throw that out. Well, the difference in an EGD and a billboard, I used to be in the billboard business, yeah, is your, your lights, you have 500 halogens and so forth, but they go back on the right. billboard itself. Now, depending on how reflective that billboard is, if it's got a lot of white in it, a lot of light color, shines back out. Right. But a lot of them don't. They've got pictures on them that they absorb right. that. <coughs> But uh, with, with the other type like you're talking about, it, it, it just emits light from the whole square footage. It emits light. It does. There are definitely a difference. But we don't have to worry because they can't put that sign that emits light in an area that's going to cause light pollution. That's right. So it's going to, there again, you're back to, you've got the control of how bright it can be because they can't let that light shine on somebody else's property. That's right. This has to be shielded. And, and so, just to let you know, when we did do some checking through town, um, we had some, some actual business people that actually went around and, and we called around, they called around for me, actually did it for me, and I thank them for that. Uh, came up with some of the aluminums, that, aluminum that, that is the light, candlelight that's let out on those signs, yeah. And I was kind of shockingly amazed that it's specifically LED, and uh, don't put out as much light as you think. Yeah. I mean, you can see it, but it's not as, intense and bright as you would think. Um, 
they were all within most of the guidelines and most of the cities that set guidelines. We don't have a set guideline, but every one of them we had, even the highest one, um, was not past what would be a normal allowable level within most of the cities that I researched. That's good. So I mean, you know, I mean, I think that most people are aware of that. You know, um, again, good taste. As you said, they, they, they don't want to distract from their business. They want to add to it. That's right. So. That's good. One, can I ask you a question, Bert? Yes. Um, you referenced the, um, the light pollution and things. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was reading my comments and I was specific, I remember when I wrote this, I was specifically thinking about Highway 82. And I said that I was concerned about neighborhoods in close proximity to areas where these would be allowed. And I said Highway 82 on the west, I meant on the south side of 82, right. not the west right. side of it. Because that neighborhood literally abuts the, 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 the Highway 82 front end. Um, what's, what is the distance that? Um, well, you know, it, it says, no excess light. Now, and I know that's vague. Uh -huh. um, my answer to that is probably not exactly what you're asking, but I, I want to explain something because this has been something we have discussed with Larry in detail. Um, what we want to do, Cor uh, Quarter Z 82 mm -hmm. is an established highway, right. and it is an established business Absolutely. district. I mean, it's an area of this, it's a central, in, you know, it's, it's, it's got all the characteristics. And what we've done is not unlike what has been done on Fifth Avenue where you actually work with zoning to correct those issues. So in other words, you put in a buffer. And that's what we want to do, mm -hmm. specifically where you're talking about. Right. Where we put in a buffer, a block in, and we turn it into neighborhood commercial, okay? So you've got a neighborhood commercial which still allows for homes, but it allows for certain business development limited into there and doesn't tra yeah. it transitions right. and and that's what's up on fifth avenue now and it works yeah. really well yeah. and we want to do that down these other quarters now that's a long-term goal with us it's one of those long-term things that we want to work toward we'll be bringing some of those to you from time to time but we go in and say we would like to change the zoning of this particular strip through here you know from r10 to neighborhood commercial that way the houses could stay there they could be houses but yet development could creep in but not just overtake the community so you've got that buffer area and that's that's a that's a normal zoning practice you know it's a normal development practice and um, we want to implement that practice here because it right. promotes business and sure it promotes it community and it ties it all together it does. Okay. and um, that's our goal as far as an area is just like what you're describing right. personally I don't have an issue with the EG signs outside the historic district but my but my concern is and that's what I put on my notes to everybody is I just don't want us to become this sign wasteland and I know you were talking about billboards a minute ago I'm thinking more of you know a business sign not a, not yeah. a big billboard type sign um, where everybody's trying to <clears throat> out sign their neighbor you know with bigger right. flashier you know brighter whatever so that that's that's my concern and I and I would defer to Bert and his department to help with some suggestions on how to address that it sounds like well, I think we already have, actually, yeah, exactly. because you're limited to the amount of square footage of right. sign that you can put up. Now, right. you may choose to put one 300 square foot sign up and it be LED, right. or you may choose to do an 80 an here and a, a right. Yeah. And, and that gives the discretion back to the businesses. Right. It makes it a lot more friendly for them to operate here. One of the okay. things that was mentioned in, in Macon that I put down, and I think, Drew, you might have addressed it, is that the Macon has 50 square feet or 25% of the total sign area. And that 25% of the total size area then would tie into the lot size because then the bigger the lot, the bigger the sign, sure. then the, the bigger the available space for the EGD display. So that's, that's just something out there. That's if it a, were to be regulated, it would need to be regulated on a percentage basis is what I think Rob's trying to say because that would only be fair because of the fact that we allow more signs for a bigger lot. I mean, if you've got a three acre lot, we're gonna allow more signage than we would for a, you know, 10,000 well, square feet. The flip feet. side of that too was the number of businesses within that lot, and I'm thinking like a little strip mall or something, Correct. where you may have a three acre lot, but you've got 10 businesses within right. that lot. Well, so. the, way we, the way we fix that is that we allow each business their frontage plus right. distance front to back, and okay. that's the way you figure their square footage. So they are treated we as already got that problem solved, business. that's correct. All right, let's move on to number two. want to limit the distance from one EGD sign to another. And I did not want to limit it. Because generally, you got a bunch of businesses right in there together. And, and once again, we're talking
talking about fairness, talking about uh, not running people off, looking business friendly. Mine was nothing about them. You know what everybody else does. I mean, I'm fine with that. We don't limit other signs. And again, right. these signs mm -hmm. are not your common every single day kind of signs. These are very expensive and going to be used rarely mm -hmm. type of signs anyway. Right. So I don't, I don't see putting a limit on this. I think that uh, through our current ordinance, we we have limited, you know, what signs, the distance between signs, et cetera, et cetera. Your setbacks, the whole setbacks nine yards. and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of already takes care of itself, really. Yeah, if you, if you right. follow our current land development code as far as signage goes and the size and distance between signs, we've addressed that issue. If you just want to follow that code, I'm going to accept the council. Can you go back just for a second? Uh, Mayor, I think that you had suggested regulating EGD signs by zoning districts to CD, GB, and commercial. Is that I, I want to hear how everybody else feels about that. Right, I, as far as the, you know, the location of EGD signs, is there anybody want to speak to what zoning districts to allow them and not allow them? I think uh, Mayor was saying CD, GB, and commercial. I mean, I don't know. Julie, will you speak to say something? CD being commercial downtown. Right. And general business and commercial. I just want to clarify that. Right. Go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Well, I just want to ask that. Bert, I mean, you already would have to issue that certificate, right? When yes. they apply for it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see putting a limit on it. Well, the only thing that I would see would be the WLI, because we do have some WLI out there that may develop into business, and we don't want to limit the WLI. I mean, that would be the only the issue that I would see. And HI. I mean, gotcha. you may have a, an HI lot, and there are a few that are on quarters that, that might, you know, want a sign and want to limit their signage. Exception of those in there? I don't know. Well, the only thing that would be limiting, as far as I would no, it would be residential. residential. I mean, that's the only real question. The, the, everything on the commercial side, and I think that's what the mayor was trying to say when he said commercial, yeah. is is fine. I mean, that's where we're at now. Yeah, we need to mention the WLI and HI. Right. I mean, I know. I, I, well, yeah. that is in that commercial category, yeah, mayor, so I was just reiterating yeah. it to make the clarification. But we're looking at everything from neighborhood commercial up. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're clear then that the commercial signs are not we're going to allow EGD signs in commercially zoned areas, but not in residential, residential professional? That's the cutoff. I mean, that residential commercial splits between RP and NC. I mean, that's, I just wanna make sure I have an understanding that that's, what, that's where we're making the delineation I just would not want it in commercial downtown, again, outside the historic district. I just want to reiterate that. But beyond that boundary, anything that falls within that commercial designation, GB, commercial, WLI, HI. It's all commercial. All yeah, commercial downtown is, is in the historic, historic district. Yeah, absolutely. All of it. There's no commercial downtown that's not in the historic right. district. There you go. <coughs> Did I ask you a question? I think so. So I think... I understand that EGD signs are, you're all good with those in commercially zoned districts, not in residentially zoned districts, and Julie, you're not in favor of EGD signs in CD. I agree with you. Uh, I know that about this number four talks do you want to limit the size of the EGD Wait, DCD, that's commercial district that's downtown commercial downtown that is commercial downtown well I am in favor of that correct you, and that's what you put down <coughs> you're in favor of having EGD signs in commercially zoned districts but not in residentially zoned districts okay. and I think Wes and Julie are not in favor of EGD signs in commercial downtown, but our own are okay in other commercially zoned districts. Okay, so you need to meet the other two people to see where they are on commercial downtown for the EGD. 
Fannie Willie. Uh, I'm sorry, Mary. Well, you can go on. You've got a that's two to one. Okay. Well, I already said my comments earlier on that. I thought so. In fact, in late, we, we went over that, that I'm okay with them as long as there's strict guidelines and boundaries for them, and then I'm okay with them in the commercial district in the city of Tiffany. And we didn't hear from Mr. Correll. I'm okay with Next issue uh, that we have on these EGD signs is you want to limit the size of the EGD size uh, sign. And I just gave an example of what they did in Macon. Not that we have to do what Macon does, but they had 50 square feet or 25% uh, of the total sign area. Or you don't have to put a limit on it except for what you know, they're allowed it for their size by the LDC. They have 300 square feet. Number three, I'm sorry, let's go back to that. Do you want to limit the proximity of these EGD signs to a residential area? And I, again, I just used Macon as an example because it was one of the few that had these great uh, address EGD signs. Theirs was 500 feet. And whether or not you want to limit the proximity or not. Well, it depend on the type and the distance and the buffer that's needed. It could be as low as 400, it could be as much as maybe 600. Maybe you don't want to just limit it to 500. I want to have a little flexibility there. <coughs> Part of I could, I could, I could make a case that according to 7.17, it's already regulated because you can't throw excess light on your neighbor. Period. And if that be the case, and we're, you know, and we enforce that, which it's we case do, by case. It is a case by okay. case. Then, if it was an issue and we were to get complaints, we would address it accordingly, and they would either have to yeah. turn it down or change the direction or something of that nature yeah. if it became an issue. And and that's probably the, the the simplest way to handle it is that it's it's actually covered under the light pollution <laughs> section of our, our ordinance that's in there currently. So basically, based would y'all just want to not even include any restrictions on proximity to the residential area That's what happened. and let the light pollution portion of the code handle that aspect. That seems to be working. That makes okay. sense. I agree with that. All right. Now we'll get to number four as far as limiting the size of the EGD sign. Again, as I, I just threw out to the Macon's, there was 50 square feet or 25% of sign area. <coughs> or you could not, don't have to limit yes. it at all. Just based what, what if you had like a 50% maximum? Would that be too much? I mean, I, I think that that would be fine if that's what you want. I mean, again, if that's what they want to limit to, because it does need to be, I would just say, it does need, if, if you decide to regulate the maximum, it needs to be regulated by a percentage of their total. Well, that's why I said so, 50%. you know, if you said 50%, then if you were allowed, if you had a three acre lot, they're allowed. 300 square feet, it would be 150. But at the same time, if you had whatever, 300, uh, 30,000 to an acre and a half, um, they only get 180, so they'd be allowed a 90 square feet, which which would put some restraints on it, if that's the direction. It would probably be a little better for not to get that um, continual street effect, you know what I'm saying, that you okay. sometimes get, because uh -huh. just like you talking about the competition that yeah. could go on. Um, you know, that would be a very feasible restriction, and I think it would be, because here's the thing, it goes back to the cost of these units, and that's what you were bringing up. You know, most people are not putting up 300 square feet, you know, LEDs or, or EDGs. They're putting up 30 foot or 20 foot or something like that. They're putting up smaller signs because that's the affordability of it and, the, and, the, and what you actually get out of it for the money. You know, I mean, and that's the criteria. Um, it doesn't mean they couldn't, but... You know, I think that a 50% restriction would be a very 
very good restriction, actually, from a departmental standpoint, and would not affect development, if you know what I'm saying, without any problem. It'd still allow them, allow plenty of space for them, you know, not be limiting. Um, at the same time, give plenty of room for, the, you know, your typical type signage and stuff like that. Too. So I probably don't need to hit that way with the paper percent tax. Deal with a lot size. Well, I mean, it would be 50% of the maximum allowable signage within a lot size, and that's 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 already set. Okay. So, you know, a large lot is allowed 300 square feet maximum signage. Okay. So if you said 50%, they'd be able to have 150 square foot maximum sign. But now that's a big area. You know what I mean? That's a big, you know, an acre okay. and a half or bigger. Yeah. So, you know, there's not a lot of those lots, but you know, they are there. And then, you know, I mean, it would be very doable, you know, because then your small lots would be a lot of smaller type sign. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, <clears throat> kind of, are we doing 50% or is that the recommendation? That was just me. I hadn't heard anybody else. I would follow Bert's lead on that. If he feels that's an appropriate suggestion, I, I would follow him. He's the expert. I, I think that's. I think that would be very, I think it would be a very good balance. I mean, I'm just being straightforward between development and between aesthetics. overall aesthetics. And, and it was, okay. Yes, sir. I think it's a very good, very good call, actually, yeah. sir. So you disagree with me. Who, who else wants to? I, I, I mean, I'm fine with following the staff recommendation on that. 50% fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's fine. Uh, number five is whether to allow them as a wall sign or <coughs> as a freestanding sign only. Now, Rob, a wall sign, is that, because uh, there's some signs that are mounted to other signs, like you may have several signs in a row, and then one of these is stuck in the middle. Or are you talking about specifically only that one EGD out there by itself? It's my understanding that wall signs go beyond the wall. Beyond the wall, attached to a building. So we're talking about what's physically attached to a building. Right. Which is regulated, by the way. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's regulated by the area of the frontage. You know, I mean, that's another regulation within our guidelines. So that would automatically limit the size of the sign. If you know what I'm saying, it would be no bigger than what wall sign I could put up anyway. This is just me talking about, I think that's very obscure and I don't see anybody doing a sign like that because they're not gonna get good visibility. If they're gonna have one of these signs, they don't have it out by the road. And as a rule, that's true, but we already have some LEDs on walls. And I mean, and that's, and, and it's fine. I mean, I, from a staff standpoint, I think it's already controlled. You know what I mean? I think we've got that part of it under control. Um, and, and we have some on walls, and I, I don't know that personally that we need to restrict them on a wall. I mean, to me, it makes no difference. If, if that business decides to put a wall sign up and it's a LED, and that's what they choose to do, they need that option. I you know, from a development standpoint. Uh, I think we should have both um, you're not going to see a lot of them, Chris. I agree with you. Yeah. You're going to see very few, but if that's an option, they won't. You know and what I'm saying? It gives them more. Well, right. I mean, we're going to regulate the size on the wall. Wall signs are never going to be over a certain size, period, because it's already regulated. Can't be bigger than the wall, right? Well, <laughs> it can't be any more, and I can, I can rook it up and tell you, but it's uh -oh. in the. It's, it's in it's the, okay, Bert. Okay. We've got you. No. Okay, how's everybody else feel on that one? I'm okay with allowing freestanding on wall signs. Okay, Julie? initially said freestanding only, but I'm going to change my mind on that. Johnny? Yeah. I'm okay. Okay. That's consensus. Uh, okay, item number six. Right. Uh, do you want to allow a scrolling message? This is, um, this gets into transition, and maybe we can talk about both of these at the same time. Um, here's number seven. You know, the transition is how does how does that display change? Does it scroll to a different message then you got another display? Does it repicturize and then does it fade away and something come back? I mean, is some you know ordinances restrict the manner in which the message changes, and you know it doesn't. And it, it might as well be talking about number eight, too, as far as the time of the display, because that also gets into the idea of scrolling. So all this has to do with how your message changes, how long the, the message is going to be there, and you know, from both an aesthetic standpoint and from a safety standpoint. Now, the issue with the scrolling sign, naturally, is you know, it all depends. Again, we've talked about this before. Is the attention that it's devoted to the sign 
so that you can read the message and the driving public, how long does that take their eyes off the road to read the scrolling message versus having the message displayed for a period of time and then either fade away, repixelize, and then a new message. So that's why I was trying to get in to hear what y'all what y'all's thoughts are about having a message scroll uh, versus having a, a message, the transition change either through a quick scroll, uh, repixelization, and then how long do you want that there? What does it matter? If people that own the business, how they want to design it, what, what does it, I mean, if it scrolls and then stops and then scrolls something else, or if it scrolls on to something else, why does that make such a big difference? Yeah, yeah, it really, to me, I think it's just a safety issue as far as how long you have to devote your attention to the <laughs> message. And again, it, I don't have any, doesn't matter to me, yeah. but I mean, it's, these are just things that need to be considered about how you, you know, because it, it is an issue about how long you want to have that uh, display there, particularly, so people you know have a chance. To, they're not trying to read something where they're trying to drive and make sure that the message there is long enough that you know they're not trying to it, it's just, just distract them from their from driving is, is the main thing. Typically, what what we see right. in our, in our research, not. just to let you know, our research is something I'm not trying to say is that. Generally, you find it varied from five to 10 seconds between changes. I mean, you know, that's a very typical across the board. Some will be five, seven, you'll see eights, you know, up to 10. Um, any of those numbers in there are very doable. Um, five seconds requires, I mean, allows faster change. You know what I'm saying, of signal. But what you don't want to get to is the flashing and strobing. Because if you don't put some kind of constraint, say five seconds, then you can change it every 0.1 seconds. So guess what you got now? You got a flashing sign. Okay, okay. Then I say well, that's got down with the thinking address of that. I, right. I'll just start, then we'll go to each person. Number six, uh, I had an answer of yes. Number seven, I said give the option for all. Number eight, I had five to ten seconds. And then you got the business order restriction whether you want to do five or you want to do ten. And that kind of worked well on what you were saying, Bert. Right. I'd, I'd say put five to ten on number eight. Now, how does everybody else feel? The only thing I would suggest to that is that I would just say if you want five to be the minimum, let it be five the minimum because they may want to have them up there. Right now I time the signs <coughs> at uh, CVS and those are on about a 12 second, 14 second, depending on which one you look at. They may want to go more than 10. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You do it want to restrict on leaving don't that up there longer. Don't, you know, they got tissue paper for 20 five, seconds and then they go up 15, and put it. Right. right. I mean, they could go as high as they wanted to on how long they left up a okay, sign. Just say minimum, just of five. Five. minimum of five. Is what and then I'm let saying. it be their discretion, That's which right. I had been a soldier. Gives them more, gives them more I like that. feedback. Minimum of five. Okay, I changed mine to minimum of five. It is discretion on how far they want to go up. What does everybody else think about six, seven, eight? I had just said I would rely on staff recommendation. I can, I'm fine with five as a minimum um, on the timing. and um, Scrolling was okay with me. Okay, Johnny? I'm good. Uh, with, with, okay. With staff recommendation. Okay. Uh, I, I'm good with scrolling. Uh, I'm okay with the different transition types. I would like to see the time of display really north of five closer to 10, just so we don't have any instances of people trying to look and the next thing you know they run into somebody. Uh, uh, but I, I can live with five, but I would like it a little north of there closer to 10. Well, I agree with Chris's statement there. Um, I, I'd like to see it north of five too, and I'd say 10. Um, I also went by CBS and uh, on the way up here today, and, uh, CBS, of course, they may have changed the message. Right, I mean, that was just one day. And right, I looked, right. You know. um, I counted uh, about six seconds there, and CBS was 10 plus seconds. Right, well, CBS is one yeah, I counted. Yeah, right. Time right. there, so, uh, um, excuse me, uh, CBS was six seconds, Walgreens was uh, 10 plus. Um, and then um, I'm okay with uh, six and staff recommendations for uh, six and seven. But, you know, but I think I'd uh, probably need to go north on the amount of time. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm at, too, really. Closer to 10. 
instead of medium at seven. I mean, I'm just I throwing out, seven. you know. I go, yeah. seven I go, below, yeah. I go seven. seven, okay. Is that okay? I seem to be a consensus. Okay. Um, number nine has to do with brightness. What I've seen mostly is that uh, most of these signs have a photo cell dimmer capable of dimming the brightness based on the amount of ambient light. And that seemed to be pretty generally what most of these um, um, ordinances have provided for. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know, I'm not in the sign business, but most of these have that ability to dim based upon the ambient light that's being, um, that's out there. Probably a lot of them have a factory preset. It's already, it's already, it's already built there. in to most of them. It so. truly is. So I, I do think that, uh, that again, that's a, a safety issue because it, it could get too bright. And so I, I would think that that might be something we'd like to include in there. That Bob would dimming. like to consider the fact <laughs> that the dimming is okay unless it's affected by other lights, such as street lights or theater lights, something that, that when you dim it down too low because of something that's already there, like say a street light, that it doesn't have the impact. I think it's the ambient light, which right. this is all your light. So that would include lights coming from the street lights, daylight. So it, it's all the light. That's the ambient light, including other sources of light other than the sun. Most of the signs that I read about, Mayor, just to explain what I think he's saying is they're brighter in the daylight when it's really bright daylight, so you can see the sun. But at night, as the, as the light gets lower, whether it be in a dark, dark alley or whether it be in a lighted corner with, with overhead, uh, you know, lights, it adjusts accordingly. And believe it or not, now with all the computer hookup and everything that's with them, it will adjust and read the ambient light and adjust accordingly. So it's not an immediate thing, so the headlights and stuff don't affect it, but if there's a security light that comes on over it, it's going to not dim down as low as it would if there wasn't one. Okay, so, so I have so to they adjust the store that sells peas on the corner and the store that sells peas in the middle of the block. Right. And one on this end has the bright, bright street light. So I ain't got to worry about it. It's the light. It's going to adjust itself. itself to where it meets whatever criteria they talk about for putting out that specific luminal light. Okay. So, um, as far as having uh, a dimmer <coughs> to adjust for ambient light, is everybody pretty much in agreement with that? Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Uh, number 10. Again, we talk about the flashing, blinking, and strobing lights. Um, Bert's address, uh, basically, we talked about the EGD lights. And my understanding is that everybody's good with them scrolling and changing the message, you know, and that message changing every, you know, or staying on for at least every six seconds. With that, I mean, so when we get to the idea of seven, flashing blink. Seven. 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 Thank you. Oh, come on, man. Uh, so it, flashing blink and stroke. What do you all think about these signs being able to flash blink and stroke? Well, I think I made my sentence clearer. I don't want them stroking and blinking. Flash. That's just me. I We're down to our last issue, which has to do with the uh, interior EGD signs. This is not something that I don't know that we've really fleshed out or addressed, um, but I think that the, the, this came really from the planning and zoning folks uh, asked that the council look into regulating interior EGD signs, and so that's why this particular item is on our list. Planning zone. Right now, our ordinance reads that, that we can only regulate exterior lighting. I cannot regulate what somebody hangs on the inside of their window. Um, even though it's a sign, even though it can be as bright as they want to make it, I can't tell them they can't have it there. Um, whether it's historic or whether it's out in the street. Okay. Now, again, these are talking about interior window signs. Um, the question is, is um, and it's come up, and it's come up, I get it 
daily in the office about why don't we regulate interior signs to some level because um, you're seeing a lot of stores where it just becomes it becomes light pollution um, and, and and I may have to start regulating some of them at that level to be honest with you but uh, you know it has come up as a suggestion from from some citizens as well as from um, there, and it is a, a situation that would have to be looked into. Am I not right from a legal standpoint, Mr. Attorney? Yeah. But is that something that you would really, I guess the question at hand is, do you want us to look into if we would might want to limit the amount of, 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 of lit signage on the interior windows? Let me tell you how I feel. Um, we never have. They've always been able to use the interior lights and turn them either way. They can right. turn them to the yes, inside sir. of the building as well as the outside. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think we should mess with that in the historic district or outside the historic district. But I, I do think there needs to be a time limit. I, I, I don't think it ought to be we go all night. And, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's, a very good, that's a very good suggestion. I mean, that's an uh, idea. And that's why we're here. That's why, I think that's what this question's here for, is to get your input yeah. as a group or as individuals. Uh, as I would say don't limit about. it, but, but uh, you know, we might want to turn it off at 10 p.m. Signs like open signs where people hang out there for barbershops. That's or, or you see a lot of now. I mean, in fact, I'll give you a prime example. Downtown on the corner of Third and Main is a sign that runs inside our business, and it's an LED, and it runs flash blinks and strobes all day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, mm -hmm. in the downtown. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm not saying she, sh you know, that that business shouldn't have that sign. I'm inside. saying on the inside. I'm saying, do you want it to run flash blink and, and strobe 24 hours a day, seven days a week? And it does actually violate some of that blinking and strobing aspect. Mm -hmm. Even though there's a glass between it, it's still flashing, blinking, and strobing. You see what I'm saying? I mean, and there's nothing I can do about it. So that's really kind of two questions. You know, do you want to limit the time, maybe? Do you want to, if you want to allow them, but only during business hours? Do you want to allow them to, to, to scroll, scroll, but not flash blinking, you know? Road. There's a lot of questions involved with that, and it's, it, it, it can get sticky. You know, I mean, it's going to require some, some, some legal input and department input to, to come up with a good solution. But what I'm really asking for now is to try to feel to see what direction you want to take. And, I, and I've heard from the mayor. He's made two very good suggestions as far as I'm concerned. He says allow them, but limit the time frame so they're not running all night long, okay, because it, it, it's, it is polluting. Um, it may be a situation to where... You allow interior signs to be regulated at least to the level that we regulate other lighted signs, if you understand what I'm saying by that. So in other words, even though they're interior, we don't want them to be so bright interior. Right now, you can be as bright as you want inside a business. I, I just I have a problem with so regulating what they do inside. You know, they do turn around. And, I, and that's, that's, that's why we're here to talk so about it. If we can limit the, well, the time to cut it off, I'm, I'm okay. I don't want to mess with it any other way. That's just my opinion. And that's that's and, and I, I would like to hear input from others from my department to be able to pursue in a direction you know. Rob, do we want to? This just this just me filling this out here. Do we want to let Rob? I mean, let Bert do some research on that and some of the legalities, and then come back and try to put together the inside lighting in a separate ordinance at a different time to give y'all time, or do y'all want to do it tonight or what? Well, I think that would be a good idea because I believe now that. Council has addressed these issues of the EGD signs and how you want, you know, what you want to allow. Um, that may give us a little bit more, you know, information as what may be appropriate or inappropriate on the interior of the store. Um, but I, I would like to look into the ability to regulate, you know, signage inside, you know, the store. I'm not, I have not seen that that I can recall. From the standpoint that we may not be able to regulate the time, is that what you're saying? Right. That's right. We don't know that. Well, why can't we go ahead with the question tonight, and then, and then if you, if you find out that we that we can't, then we go back to business. I say we answer it tonight. Let, let me ask this question. Uh, I think what we're, what we're trying to get at here is number one: Does council want to regulate lighting inside a business or a house or whatever? That's number one. And if you do want it regulated, do you want it regulated uh, in conjunction with the other issues that you've already talked about, the lighting, the brightness, the strobing, and, and all that? Is that where you're wanting us to go? I 
I think what I said was, I don't want to regulate it at all except for the time. Okay, that's the way it is now, except there's no, no statement that says it has to quit doing its thing at 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night. And that's the only restriction I want to put on. Okay, that's inside their building. I mean, I, you I said you want to look up the legality, but I'm going to tell we're you something. Look, we're gonna look. That's a little too much intrusion for me. That's what we want to hear from counsel. Uh, I guess yeah, my thing would be, one, do we have the right to regulate what's inside somebody's business or home? And then B, if we do, do we want to just mirror our already existing right. but that's no exactly strobing, what it is. Right. balloons yeah. a certain that's way, correct. it has to have a dimmer on it or that's whatever. It. Do we want to just mimic right. our own thing? I guess that's where I'm at. Right. Can we and then right. mirror our own rules? Because to, to give you the example of what I'm talking about, I am getting complaints about an interior light that does affect a residence. <laughs> okay, now I'm not, I'm not saying good, bad, or indifferent. It can happen. Even though it's inside a light, it can be so bright <coughs> that it actually is light pollution. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's no different than a floodlight. You know what I'm saying? It shines over in the neighbor's yard but and it, affects but their but property. It, it doesn't so, go past a certain time at night, and that's not an issue. And I'm not arguing your point, Mayor. I agree with you. I thought that was a really good, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I'm just saying, you know, what level do you, you know, I mean, is there any, I would like to hear input from other people because what Chris is saying too is that, you know, we may want to look at it from, you know, balancing it to everything else. Um, and I'd like to hear from everybody. That's I'll one of the questions. Um, well, if, we can, if we can, and that's a big if, granted. But, you know, there's no need enough spending time looking at the legality if the council doesn't want to touch it at all or if nobody on the council even wants to even look into it, okay? Um, obviously, the mayor says he wants to look into it time limit wise. You want to look into it being consistent with the outside, as Chris said. Any other statements from? I, th I think we need to look into it. I think we need to, uh, because the only thing that's separating the inside and the outside is a clear fan glass. Right. And it's a loophole that people are figuring out how to jump through. And um, and I'm getting complaints too and, and calls just like you are. And, and I think we need to look at it. Right. So, so is it okay, and I'm not trying to step into here, but is it okay now if y'all agree that, that what we will do is myself and Rob will look into the legality of whether we can or can't and how we can and can't and how other communities are handling it on whatever aspect they're handling it on, whether it be length of time, whether it be brightness, whether it be whatever. Okay? Good. That's what we're doing. Thank y'all very much for that. That's it. Okay, now, we, uh, you know, <coughs> I've got the people here, and of course I wanted to go, let the people speak first. I see that Darlene and Lori had to leave. But uh, anyway, we made the decision speak last so uh, but gosh I kind of hate the limit I've got one two three four five people that want to speak and that's what's written down here Diane and left Darlene left um, those five people I say give them five minutes speak is anybody got a problem with them all right I'm gonna call them out as they were listed on this we're all ready for this part right yes I'm gonna ask you when you when you come up please repeat your name and your address uh, and, and Larry, you'll be keeping keep your time. And you'll have up to five minutes to these five people right here. Uh, uh, the first one to sign up was uh, Hal Baxley. My name's Hal Baxley, and uh, I own property at uh, 612 uh, Tift Avenue. I also own a building on uh, at 225 uh, 2nd Street. Uh, I had made up a proposal, which is very, very similar to exactly what the uh, what the mayor had said. Uh, first thing I want to do is address this this issue of uh, decertification. Okay, the lady I was here when the phone call was made. The phone call indicated she indicated that no matter what the council decided about the sign issue, that most likely that would not cause decertification. She said there's only been two cases, period. One of them asked to be decertified, which was Thomasville, Georgia. And then the other one was because that they had to put a bank in and it changed 30% of the small district that they had and they had to make the decision to get them decertified. Okay, so the decertification is not the issue. Okay, then the next thing is, is this. The monies that have come in of which she wouldn't give us or didn't give us the amount, which I think you'll find is not that, that significant, but if it is, it has to be matched either with public monies 
or with private monies. Now, in return for that money that you get, you must go by a rigid set of guidelines on the, on the construction or remodeling of that building, and it will cost you at least twice as much to try to get that done. And, and you're not going to get anybody to put millions of dollars in a building if they're not allowed to do what they need to do to make that building a business success for them. The proposal I came up that would be, to me, the most fair way of doing this, and then it would avoid the lawsuits, which if you don't do this right, is going to be inevitable, is this. Take away all of the signage, and here's the proposal. Propose that all reference to any signage and historic guidelines be removed and would be un uh, and it would be unnecessary to obtain any certificate of appropriateness from the Historic Preservation Commission. All signage would be allowed to according to Uniform Land Development Code of 2012. Any frame, LED, tube light, neon, stick sign, banner, flag, or any other sign not mentioned shall, shall be subject to the same guidelines that govern every region, district, and part of the city of Tifton. The set, the, uh, the, uh, Sentence in the LDC that refers to a sign not being allowed to blink, scroll, flash, or change colors shall be removed from the section. Also, the LDC would be changed to allow up to six square feet of moving sign in the residential professional section of the historic district and may be lit only during business hours. This proposal would serve the business owners of Tifton the greatest, uh, with the greatest, in the greatest manner, allow maximum advertising promote new business locations, which would increase tax revenues while protecting the integrity of the residential community. Now, Tifton, Georgia is a great place to be, but if you start restricting, which that's what you're doing, and, and when you restrict a, 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 the historic district to stay in the 1930s and the 1940s and use those type of advertising, you're restricting the amount of businesses that will locate there. That's already been proven. So what I'm saying is, is this, it would be a, a better approach to, 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 to take that away from it, let the LDC cover that, and let, the, and let the Historic Preservation Commission do what it's actually designed to do, which is help, if this was supposed to be an advisory, Ms. Mary Glenn uh, uh, Watson, or Mary Glenn uh, Hendricks, was the one that she made, helped make these guidelines. She told me out of her mouth that the HPC was started as an advisory, not as a guideline, not as somebody to give an appropriateness to say what you can and can't do. This was supposed to help the business owner to recreate something that would be, that would be beneficial to his business. And so, so my, my thinking is, is this, if you start restricting lights, then you're going to have to, go, this will be readdressed. I can promise you it will be readdressed. It may be five years from now, 10 years from now, or 20 years from now. But it will be addressed again, and it, and it also could even go to the part of going to, to the court system, because that, that very well could be too. You've already got CB, uh, CVS and Walgreens that you cannot, you cannot uh, grandfather them in there. They are in the commercial district, and they have the LED lights. To allow them to have it and to allow no one else to have it would be a travesty. Thank you. You have to pray for a second. You have five minutes on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> next person on the list uh, is Phil uh, Baxter. No. I've got your name up here. Yeah, well, I'm not talking. Okay. <laughs> She's not talking. So that's, that's Can I use her five minutes? <laughs> no. You have to ask that attorney, right? No. <laughs> Rob. Okay, we have Miss Eloise Steyer. Steyer. I live at 410 North Park Avenue. And I'm going to read mine because I'm tired. Uh, since April 2013, a small number of people have mounted a vigorous campaign to open downtown and other commercially zoned areas in the historic district 
to the same types of signage seen along Route 82. They have also campaigned to have the signage available to businesses located in an expanded non-commercial area based on the residential pro professional zone of the historic district. In addition, some of these businessmen advocate dispensing with the historic district altogether. The businessmen promoting signage changes have offered no evidence that increases in temporary signage, banners and stick signs, as well as lighted scrolling and other minor modern signage would increase their sales. They simply state that it will. Neither have they presented evidence that the majority of businessmen within the historic district desire these changes. The advocates of increased signage, along with some members of the city council, have a common refrain. Businesses in the historic district need and deserve to have access to all the same types of signs that are available to businesses along US Route 82. However, marketing is a complex process of which signage is only one part. I suggest that it may be a mistake to focus so heavily on signage and ignore the importance of environment. For example, what does downtown have that sets it apart from Route 82? Why did the implementation of the preservation-based Main Street program that predated the creation of the historic district result in growth instead of the continued economic and physical decline of the 1970s? Would it not be advantageous to emphasize downtown's unique features, more relaxed space in a smaller area, more intimately sized businesses with unique offerings and personnel that can provide personalized services instead of turning downtown into a visually congested imitation of the larger commercial strips with their big box stores and standardized goods and services. With these thoughts in mind, I decided to look into the role of signs in marketing and speak with some randomly encountered businessmen in Tipton. And they were random. I didn't go out and look for a person that I knew felt this way or that way. I consulted ABAC business faculty and searched the internet for information on the effective use of signs and marketing. The only mentions I found of signage issues and marketing textbooks were related to the large exterior signs that identify businesses to passers-by, not to additional exterior advertising signs. This suggests to me that marketing success is related to strategies other than extra signage. For example, social media, yellow pages, personal uh, referrals and other things. Searches of Google and Google Scholar for information on signage as an effective marketing tool uncovered a compelling publication titled Context Sensitive Signage Design by the American Planning Association. A few key points from it are number one, multiple signs result in sign blight and indicate economic distress. Number two, a single extra sign, such as a street side pole sign for a large chain store, may increase sales by as much as four and a half percent. But additional signs do not increase sales further. Three, the certainty that the rules for doing business will remain stable and be enforced equally for all encourages both business and investment. Discussions with the businessmen from within and without Tifton's historic district have led me to conclude that the signage changes. Okay, I'm going to have the next speaker continue. Okay, you got another minute. Got a minute. Got another oh, minute. I have another minute. Okay, see how fast I can go. Not fast enough. Okay, the businessmen I spoke with did not wish to be identified. However, their comments deserve consideration, and I have paraphrased the main ones here. First. I like the way downtown looks now, and I do not wish to see modern signs on the businesses surrounding mine. Number two, downtown is too small to support numbers of lighted signs similar to those on Route 82. Downtown isn't spacious enough to be a miniature Las Vegas. Number three, numerous stick signs and vertical and horizontal banners would be ugly and distracting and might well put off customers instead of attracting them especially for businesses that cater to a more upscale clientele, such as jewelers, decorators, high-end clothing stores. Number four, the old-timey, more genteel atmosphere of downtown is a major feature downtown is going for it. Destroy that, and you destroy the very thing that differentiates downtown from <coughs> Route 82 type commercial areas. Okay. Okay, I will pick 
picked up uh, with number five. Uh, I'm Charles Steyer. I live at 410 North Park Avenue. And uh, I agree with this letter. The sun age not forced to expend uh, the sun age restrictions the historic district imposes a merchant provide an even playing field to these businesses. Owners are not forced to expend funds on ex expensive uh, electronically controlled signs in order to keep up with or outshine the neighbors. Six, the Historic Preservation Commission's review of proposed business signs is a good thing. I have found it helpful. Seven, modern signage would overwhelm the relatively small storefronts characteristic of downtown and obscure the distinctive features. Eight, you will start a sign war and the number and variety of signs will quickly get out of hand. Additionally, I feel strongly that buying property and or establishing business within the city creates a contract between the city and the individual, a contract that requires both parties to abide by the regulations laid out in the land development code at the time of purchase. All of us within Tifton, whether property owners, resident, residents, or businessmen, whether inside or outside of the historic district, should be able to rely upon the city government to protect our monetary investments and quality of our lives by maintaining the environments that attracted us in the first place. Many of the residents of the historic district, whether they live in residential, residential, professional, or commercial HD zones, or operate businesses within them, either advocated for the creation of the historic district 25 years ago, or bought property within the district more recently based on the protections provided by the historic district designation. It's not surprising that many of these folks are concerned by the changes being contemplated by the city council and unsubstantiated, unattributed opinion voiced in the Tipton Gazette's rant and rave column. I encourage our city councilmen to remember the positive changes that were wrought in downtown even before the creation of the historic district by reliance upon the Main Street program that was developed by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and is based on the economic power of historic preservation. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And I'll wait. Okay, the next person <coughs> I have is, is David Steyer. I believe everything has been said that I would say. Okay, David, thank you. And, and that was it. So Diane left. Um, Thought of sales was rising. Well, she normally is. I think that would be up to counsel if you want someone wants to make a motion. I make a motion we allow Ms. Sales to speak. Second. All in favor, say what was saying, huh? Okay. After how long? <laughs> we all have a consensus that she can speak. <laughs> For how long? City Council. I was at a, another meeting, came in late, so I didn't see the list to sign up. But I'm Bonnie Sales. So I live at 615 Tift Avenue, and um, I just wanted to just discuss some of the signage issues in our neighborhood. It is um, a residential professional neighborhood. It is not a commercial district. As we've mentioned, CVS and Walgreens are in a commercial district. But this is a neighborhood and it is a buffer zone to the residential area and I've spoken to at least six or seven of my neighbors on Chestnut Avenue and they have all said that they didn't know they had to come to a city council meeting to have city council um, uphold the historic district, the mayor and city council. They said that's the mayor's job and, and the city council's job is to protect the have no signage as is in the guidelines for the residential professional district to, to have the signage that's blinking. I'm talking about the strobing and blinking signs. And they said, um, they, they um, just reiterated that this is their neighborhood and it's not, it should not be allowed in, in a residential professional area. Um, I had one person that said they didn't care and that was a renter who was farthest away from what is currently strobing all through the middle of the night right now and I've t one of the pre people I talked to said that 
It's alarming to him. It looks like a, um, a fire truck or something stopped in the middle of the night when he's out, when he happens to go out in his yard in the middle of, at night to see a strobing flashing light that's been going on since April. And so, um, also this is not something that I am opposed to individually. It's something that is in our guidelines that we shouldn't have this on the street. Um, I, it's not something that, it's only, it's allowed internally, it is internally right now. It's not there just because I stopped it being po posted on a sign outside on the street. It's our neighborhood that does not want it posted on Tift Avenue on a sign outside, the, uh, outside their business. So, so, so repeat that again, I think I missed that. The, um, it's not something that I am the only, that my husband and I are the only ones that are opposed to this. Uh -huh. It's something that's in the guidelines that it should not be allowed to be on a sign in front of the business. Oh, okay. And, okay. Um, so, it, and well, as I said, I spoke to my neighbors. I did get a signed petition I didn't have bring tonight, but they do not want uh, this uh, flashing sign in the neighborhood on, on Tift Avenue. And they did not think that they needed to come to tell city council that, they, that this is, should not be required, be, should not be allowed here. Um, and there is nothing currently that stops them from, from having a sign inside as you said, but it would be considerable, nice if you would consider a time restraint to having that, a flashing sign inside a building. Now, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, uh, the, the people that, uh, that sign that, are they talking about it's okay to do it during the daytime but, but cut it off at night? No, they said they do not want a flashing strobing light. At all, 20 at hours all. a day. No, the they don't want it on Tift Avenue. They said that they said that the it's the uh, to a man. Every one of them said, but this is the historic district. We shouldn't have a flashing sign here. And that's what, and these are property owners. Um, we have bought property there and expect it because it was a historic district. It was designated a historic district, and there's guidelines that protect it from being a gaudy uh, something. I mean, it's a genteel feel as. Somebody said earlier. So there's guidelines that protect that genteel feeling of a historic district. Can you can you get that to us? That yes. Number? How many people do you have on? Uh, seven or eight. Seven or eight people that live that are affected by that. that yes. Percent? Yeah. I mean, could you just get it to Corona or something? Yes. Because we'll have it in the record. Now, see, everybody else turned in a little thing. You might have seen that. They were that what they were going to say. Oh, I, I think it'd be beneficial if you no. had, if you could just I can bring it to the next meeting, to the next public hearing. Yeah, or just get it to Ron, it would be fine, and that way we have it in the records. And, okay. And that's good, that supports you. And uh, I was gonna give her a little more than five because I, I've been talking to her, so, uh, so you, you, got, you, got, you got another minute or so if you want. No, that's fine. Okay, thank, thank you, Mike. Uh, can, I, can I just respond to that since I only <coughs> had the five minutes and- Mr. Turner? I mean, my wife was on the list, so she can talk. But I mean, we've had, we gotta, we gotta follow a rule there. I think, we, unless the council wants to, you know, deviate from what the rule is, you have the right to do that. Well, we take the same vote we did with Bonnie. Well, if you want to take it, get a consensus about whether or not you'd like to hear again from Mr. Uh, Baxley. Well, we took the vote for Bonnie. I know, and that was my mistake. It shouldn't be. You know, we don't have motions and votes and workshop. I was going to ask you about that when the meeting was over. Right. Meeting. But if, any, if everybody's in, in agreement that they'd like to hear again from Mr. Baxter, maybe I'll come reach a consensus on that if you want to change what your normal course of, uh, what your rules of procedure are. I'm fine. Okay. She gave up her Thank you.
stated the facts and the rules that um, she wants followed, but our sign is following the rules. I mean, nobody's told us that we can't have it 24 seven. Um, that's the only way we get any kind of advertisement out of it is really at nighttime because you can't see it in our window. So, I mean, the rules are the rules and, and I just wanted to clarify that. And that ends the discussion. Um, we'll close that at this time. Uh, I need to keep this muted for just the rest. Okay. I'd scratch through the <coughs> field, but you might want to okay. do that through. Well, I did scratch through Diane, too. Uh, but you may want to scratch through that. I've got the more secure clock. Okay. Well, I think that's it. We can't talk about anything else. We get locked up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was a, I think it was a good meeting, a lot of discussion, a lot of open discussion, and uh, some different views. But I think we worked through them. Uh, and that's good. So, uh, uh, Mayor, yes, we did mention it. I, I don't think it'd be an appropriate discussion, but we had talked about whether or not council would be inclined to have workshops, workshop <laughs> retreats. We mentioned that at our Monday meeting. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if you could just give us some direction as to whether, because we do need to schedule some time with council, and just want to get an idea, would you be more inclined to do a meeting rather than, but I want to see how the other four think, but I didn't want to take a big old retreat. We got to feed people and all this stuff. It's uh, two issues that we wanted to discuss, is the uh, DEA and the permit procedures, both of which are going to take, we thought it take pretty good bit of time considering we spent uh, about two and a half hours tonight. Mm -hmm. no, no. What was that? Those two hours. Yeah, they started to be addressed. Yeah. So we can, frankly, we as staff think it would be much better to do it as a retreat and, and I'll buy lunch if we need to buy lunch or something there, no problem. So, I'll just want I mean, I'm good either way. Whatever we need to do. West was smiling. Hey, yeah, we got that. <laughs> 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 okay. Hey, I don't care if it's retreat or, or workshop or whatever. I just want us to not continue to postpone this. Yeah, I agree with you. But I just didn't okay. want to retreat. The retreat says six hours. You know. Well, it's probably one six and three. Huh? It's probably one. Well, let's do it two meetings then. Let's, let's take each each topic and do it per meeting. It doesn't matter. I think everybody's going to yeah. focus. They want to do it. Set it up. All right, we'll set it up. But contact us so we have, you know, so we can see where. Yeah. Thank everybody for being here tonight. We appreciate it. We thank you. Please. 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 Please.